Hello. So in the beginning of 2018, I got into this building, the former Price Filler Machine Shop here on Roar Avenue in Roanoke, Virginia. A hundred year old building that was a functioning machine shop for 85 plus years. And I began the overhaul to turn it into what the shop is today. In October of 2018, me and my friends Walker Hooper and Riley Murtaugh started filming the renovation process. And in September of 2020, we quote unquote finished. Although it's, you know, it's never done, but it was a functional shop as I saw it to be at that point. So we filmed for two years. And if you're an OG subscriber to the channel, you followed us along. Many of you, however, I'm sure probably have not seen what it took to parse through all the massive 150 year old machines in here broken concrete slab, filthy roof and walls, no electrics, what it took to get from that to here. So, Walker has compiled the entire renovation process into one giant video. Enjoy. Like and subscribe. More build videos coming soon, and maybe a podcast. Bye, watch the video, go watch the video. <laughs>
one time I moved everything one plant had. You know. Oh, you emptied out a whole plant yeah. one time. Uh -huh. and, it was... and you're still standing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired even now. Oh, so, good for uh, you. <laughs> Well, how do you know Brett? Uh, he's, we are Hindi people, a Hindi lathe, and Hindi okay. was, and you actually have one over here. Yeah, yeah. They were the Cadillac of lathes in their day. Mine is 72 years old, but Brett and one of his friends have some parts, and okay. we, we just met through the practical machinist. And, uh, Which we, is the forum. Yes, the online uh -huh. forum. and we are, go a, a good, good, good website too. That has been way. an incredible resource. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. yes. I can uh -huh. post a picture yeah. of something that I know nothing about and all of a sudden I got all these guys going, well, that's one of these. And yes, sir. If you look uh -huh. underneath on the right, you'll see a number and sure enough, every time I look, it's right where they say it is. <laughs> It's got grout under it. They grouted it like tile. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but a lot thicker than tile. Uh, the, the grout will start to keep it vibrating less, you know. To keep oh. It. Well, status report. We got thing kind of kicked back a little bit. Got rollers under the front. So really a solid pull, once they get it disconnected, ought to start the process rolling. Have a delivery. What's happening? What's up, dude? I just wanted to bring by some samples. Look oh, at that, what? man. Food truck down the street. Now, see, this is smart marketing right here. The Ope, Ope's Brothers, OBST. They just opened a food truck down the street. Robert, thanks, Robert. Always hungry. Next door neighbor, there, thank you. Yeah, yes, please do. I'm going back for more. Well, Bobby, we got halfway through the shop. Yes. We are, um, we're to the point now where we need to figure out the trailer, ground to trailer transition. We got the front end of this machine off the ground a few inches. He's gonna back the trailer in, and his trailer is- Tilt bed. Is a tilt bed. Yes. And so we just hope that we can get, this is up high enough to where the transition from ground to bed is gonna work out. And he's gonna be able to winch it from the front of his trailer, I think. I think Having so. some come alongs yeah. pulling up. Mm -hmm. And then we'll be able to stabilize the top with this. I, I by no means want to take all the weight with no, this. No, I But this will take enough weight to keep it from, from tilting, I think. The immovable object has met the irresistible force. Whoa. <laughs> Okay. Right. No, 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 leave it down and then and, and just You want to put, put some it, wood under it? Yeah, put something and, and that was me. Uh, <laughs> That's what I get for touching stuff. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense now. Oh, that one's locked. Yeah, it's just... He, he, he did it with this. It may just be, it probably hasn't moved as much. Yeah, because this, one, this one's the one I used. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. Is now a good time to get you to sign a waiver? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I kept filming most of the time. When we were moving it, I was like, imagine if something terrible happened. <laughs> <laughs>
Come on! Hold, hold, hold! All right, time out. The other one came. I will. I didn't. Uh, oh, nice. I didn't see it as a reason oh, to stop. It. You know. Uh, not as strong as Bobby. Mm -hmm. Some more. Right. What do you think? I mean, my tires are spotting a little bit. Oh, okay, okay. And I mean, hey, we're good. Yeah, it, it's 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 way down the truck. I know because it was. Those you know, chains are normally about that height off off the ground. Okay. okay. Well, Tay, have you got anything challenging? At the <laughs> Come on now. This well, wasn't that tough. No, this was part A. Oh. That pond is next. Oh, okay. You're sticking around for that, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Job does this thing enable you to do? Well, this is uh, this one enabled me to do obviously it's a 36 inch chuck, mm -hmm. meaning you can grab something that's 36 inches or a little bit bigger. Yeah. Right? When you start getting into that size uh, pieces, they get heavy, and so instead of putting in a conventional lathe where all the weights hanging out off the ch chuck jaws, right. here gravity is working for you. What do you think of this thing now that it's out in the sunlight? Please with it. And you're up in Pennsylvania. I am in uh, South Central Pennsylvania in Lancaster County. I had a blast, Thank honestly. You. That was definitely the machine I was most concerned about because it was the furthest and most secluded back in this corner. to finally see some big pieces come out of here. Like, the point is to be able to use this space and with every hole that you make, you're like, oh good, how can I fill that up, you know? <laughs> but hopefully with something functional, hopefully with something functional, not a, a derelict piece of machinery. I'll get that, you gotta get that visual. David, I met David before, and he is a fantastic character. And the only other free things I got in life is a bloody nose and ride in a police car. Those get easy, they get easier <laughs> each, free rides in a police car get easier each time. He, uh, 
He's got stories for everything. You can tell he's been in this kind of world for a long time. He told me one time he rode a motorcycle down to like Panama and back from Virginia. <laughs> so, so like, he's done a lot. Showed up today kind of by surprise to pick up a lathe that I told him he could have. It was an old Ryerson, he called it a bombshell lathe, um, which makes sense. The time period was right for that. And that one was just neglected. It needed some help to restore it, which didn't place it in a very desirable market. You know, it needs love, it's hard to move, um, and I need it out of here. Yeah, it's, it's a bombshell lathe. If you look at the World War II film clips, you'll see women with carts of nothing but shell projectiles mm -hmm. forever, and they're standing at a lathe. So the women just click it in gear. Rosie the Riveter cranking out yeah, bombshell. And she'll yeah, she'll it back. At government training centers all over the country, women are being taught how to handle the machines which are turning out our armaments and munitions of war. More and more women are releasing men for the fighting services. And when it comes to welding, the girls prove that they can handle a blowtorch as easily as a cigarette lighter. Young women must be ready to step into their places without loss of time. Months ago, the National Youth Administration, anticipating that need, began to prepare young women for jobs in war industry. Employers in the war production industries are now making use of young women in handling small machine tools, such as small lathes, drill presses, and grinders. Young women have done especially well in those jobs requiring precision and a high degree of manual dexterity. How is this one different than most lathes? It's short. Right. It's absolutely short. So it's short, it's chunky. Yeah. It was for machining projectiles, cannon projectiles. These, yeah. just like this one, are given away every day because they're no damn good for anything. Well, that's how you're getting it. Unless you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know yet what I'm going to do with it, but I'll use it for my friends. It's too good to go to waste. Yeah. It, it, again, will have one specific purpose. I mean, if you got one short job to do once a month, you have other legs in the shop, so it's mm -hmm. not worth even having. But it's for repetitive purpose or to be customized into something for a specific I see. purpose. Could so, be yeah. a blank canvas, sort of. You have prep this a little bit. You've yeah, raised cleaned, it up. Cleaned out some on You've got some rollers underneath it. Mm -hmm. I'll make a hole for you and then we'll we'll roll it. about moving stuff out is that you pull it out of the dark corners and then you pull it into the light you can you can it looks you know you can really take stock of what you got this is the pulley that would have been hooked to the system in the ceiling and it would have turned this which would turn your chuck but if you wanted to gear it down you could engage these big old gears back 
What I love about these old machines is that modern stuff would have guards, covers, shrouds. This stuff, you could stick your finger right, right in all the dangerous places. You still got all your fingers? I was just gonna say if you want. Your thumb's been put back on four times. <laughs> <laughs> four different times you lost your thumb? Yeah. It's one cut started there, there. You see where I lined up? It went in there, all the way to there. Went in that one, it came out over here. But that wasn't a record. That was, you see where they were lined up? There was only 34 stitches at one what, time. What happened? You had cut off wheel on a grinder, mm. abrasive cut off wheel, thanks to some other it dummies. Ex it exploded. Somebody uh -huh. dropped it and didn't tell you. Stupids over there, the metal moved and made it kick back. Damn. Yeah. I've seen people get real hurt by those cutoff wheels. That one They'll got shatter in your face and all kinds of stuff. Scars. Yeah, I saw a boy in Vancouver get hit in the juggler. Right? Mm -hmm. If we hadn't jumped on him and held it, yeah. he would have died. <laughs> His scar's gone now, but there's 17 Hold stitches. your thumbs up like this. That's amazing you've lost that one four times. Yeah, well, and I've got... Uh, <laughs> Can you feel it? You got yeah, feeling it? I got four-way fingers that do what they're not supposed to do. <laughs> that one's got 17 stitches you can't see now. It got cut off and was hanging by the leaders. Well, it, it cut it loose and twisted it out of the joint and was uh -huh. hanging down. It sure. Back. Done that New Year's Day drunk moving a liquor still with frozen hands. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Dude. Yeah. You got some. That is, and I am truly amazed that you have all your fingers. Me too. <laughs> that I, is I genuinely do amazing. That's doing this stuff. And they do cool stuff now. Yeah, doing. <laughs> <laughs> doing, doing rigging, machine work, mechanic work, other mm -hmm. stuff, motorcycle racing and crashes and stuff. And I, I'm still a musician and can still do this till I've been lucky and blessed. I counted up here the time I've been in 20, either 23 or 28 times for stitches. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. You're like, uh, you know, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. Who so was that? Six million dollar man. Yeah, right. So yeah. I've, been, I've been on my own since I was 12 years old. Uh huh. Run away from home from sorry ass bunch of white trash and I've been on my own and I had to eat and I had to live so I wound up in these old machine shops a kid as an oiler. Learning from old guys. Yeah and I yeah. I, I, I wound up on the, on the welding and rigging jobs and stuff as a punk and, and you know things like that and traveling and working and doing it you had to do for yourself and you didn't have nothing. Right. And when you spend your entire lifetime in that environment things like that happen. Would they, you say that those were hard lessons, learning stuff the hard way. <laughs> Some of it was just plain ass accidents even while being careful. Right. Think, you know, the, it, it, the graph goes like this. The longer you don't have the crash, the worse the crash is gonna be when you have the crash. If you have little ones, then the angle changes. Right, right, right. And right. sometimes no matter how careful you are, how things happen. I mean, things patient happen. hazards, man. So I'm just part of the job. Stitches through that head right there and <laughs> eyeball been hanging out and everything else. I mean, what? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Stitches Dude. through there and these scars here. Eyeball popped did out, you eat, head what, smashed. Did you drink a lot of milk when you were a kid or yep. you got special skin? <laughs> What's <laughs> the did. secret, man? Sure did. <laughs> well, that being said, let's be careful. Okay, yeah. let's move slowly. <laughs> 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 You made a load spreader, is that what this is? Yeah, and the reason I didn't just throw a chain up there and throw it over that, when you're pulling dimensionally like this on the chains and you put the pressure here, uh -huh. you're increasing it mucho fold on that link. Uh -oh. you get a chain pop. So, use two chains and use the yin yang, and now you're doing it in four places instead of one. Mm -hmm. And you're spreading that evenness out. Nice. Okay, that was my brain. Thank Double you. Strength. Mm -hmm. and Where are you going? Where are you going? So, what do you want for Christmas? <laughs> I wonder what color this thing will be to be. Most of this old shop equipment. That weird green color? That was what they call easy eye green later in the years. Most of this early, early stuff was satin black. Satin black. Most of it. Not yeah. all of it. Most of it.
to a chair for here, room. We're going over four feet, I'd say probably about five foot two or three. That's a bit, uh, that's 51 inches. Okay, not as much as I felt. What do we got here? Oh. Oh, man, first. to go this morning and get kind of some essentials, rags and water and that kind of thing. Um, but I did. <laughs> All of those stories. Sweet. Yeah. And then I found five bucks. I'm happy to have it out of my shop. I'm happy that it's going to somebody that will continue to use it, possibly restore it. If not, just hold it for somebody to then put it into use. But. Um, I got some real estate back. You're happy. You got it for the right price, right? Yeah. Free 99. Yeah. Plus shipping and handling, of uh -huh. course. Well, they say the best things in life are free. Give me a hand. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you. Bon voyage. Just talking to somebody who's very knowledgeable and has spent a lot of time in this field is so valuable you know because like i said you can't hardly go anywhere where do you go to look up how to get a remake a part for a 1905 lathe you know this guy's done a lot of work uh, in the oil fields and things where they're moving big stuff all the time so someone who knows the machine but also knows how to move it is hard to find but really nice when you do In an effort to get this shop back up and running as soon as possible, the machines that I don't have a use for have been leaving at a pretty quick pace. This massive pond time saver lathe is the next metal behemoth to make its way out of the wooden double doors. This task would have been impossible would it not have been for the talented riggers from commercial steel erection right down the road. With the right rollers, jacks, and experience, this lathe went from buried under the mezzanine to the back of the twin axle rollback in a matter of hours. So sketchy. <laughs> of course, they do this. Yeah, you're behind the full weight of the machine. While they made it look easy, it's important to remember that one wrong move and this 30,000 pound iron giant could easily tip over, crushing anyone between it and the ground. Yeah. But this is the first time this lathe has seen daylight in probably 40 years. Bob here, the guy that owned the shop, got it from the railroad when they retooled their shop. Never hooked it up, sat right there in the middle of the shop and never used it. So. John, the guy that bought it, is really excited. He's gonna bring it back to life and start using it again. Uh, meanwhile, I got all this space back. So it's a win-win. Well, this is my neighbor, Connor and Jerry. How you doing? Uh, what do you think? Man, that's, that's, that's a feat, man. man. Yeah, 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 man. It took, it out of there. took the right truck and the right crew, for yeah. sure. 
Yeah. It went up and across. It went up on it a lot better than I thought it was. I yeah. thought it was going to be a lot more. Well, that first section when it's barely on each end, that's the sketchiest part. Once you get it, and yeah. once you were able to tilt that bed down too to meet the angle, that's right. It all made sense. Thank you, fellas. Yeah, thank you. you did a great job. Yeah, no problem. That was awesome. Yeah, you know, we'll move calls. Well, give me your card. I might need you again. <laughs> That was so fast. What the sh Yeah, dude, they killed that, man. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you come with the right tools. You yeah. know, like they came with the rollers and the jacks and the, the, the right truck. That truck's a beat. They planned that sh up to a team. Yeah, that's not the first time they've moved something that big. <laughs> Sad to see it go, but huge i had no use for it it's going to a guy that's going to restore it and love it and feed it and house it and all that stuff so uh I, i'm i'm excited for phase two look at all this space we got back now we can get up under here and i, I think the plan later is to probably take this down it's a little sketchy don't really trust it for much so now that that's gone we can get equipment in here and make this whole job a lot easier Remember David got the lathe last week. He's gonna come back and get the matching pulley from the ceiling. So it should be a quick one, but this is this will be cool. We get to learn how they uh, how those work. Why is it important to get the matching pulley? So when you change the belt from speed to speed, the belt's not too long or too short. And also to, if you're counting ratios or doing math per revolution, you need to know what they are and they need to be matched. Right, instead of just driving it with any old thing. Mm -hmm. Well, cool, you earned it. Thank you, there I you appreciate go, it. And like I told you before, I gave him a word as man, that machine will not go to waste. Awesome, well now I know you can use it. The second machine to be moved out today is an eight foot GA gray metal planer. John, a local machine tool enthusiast, wants it for his home shop and I'm happy to oblige. Why do you want a massive eight foot metal planer? John? Well, you know, as planers go, this isn't too particularly big. <laughs> this is <laughs> There's small. no, there seems to be no upper limit. So this is the, you're telling me this is the, the, the baby version? Yeah, this is the, the home shop version. <laughs> <laughs> Like a lathe cutter, it's just a, just a just not to wise my finger too. Sure. And so it'll just sit there. And, and your the work is go, bolted yeah, to here. Your work's bolted there. Right. And it's gonna go and it's gonna just go shave off a tiny, tiny bit. And then this thing's gonna go and it, ratchet sideways. Oh, I see. And go and it goes over and over until finally you've traversed thus achieving the whole a width. perfectly flat surface. Yeah. Well, within a thousand. Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's the whole. There's no perfection. No, right, there's no but. perfection. The people try. What do you think this thing weighs? Uh, I've done some research. I found an actual, uh, someone linked to it, a practical machinist, an actual copy of an, an advertisement. Oh, cool. For this exact model, except a little, a little, little smaller, mm -hmm. six foot, this is eight foot. Right. And so, but it's a little, little fatter. And they, they, they boasted it's a, it's a sturdy 12,000 yeah. pounds. And Twelve. That, so the smaller version of this was twelve thousand. Yeah. Pounds. So I'm guessing this could be up to up to fourteen. You know, it's a little narrower, so you're going to lose some weight. But well, it's that, a little longer. That so also that. makes it a little sketchy too, because now we have a we have a narrower base. Yeah. A little tip hazard. Yeah, but you know, if you just take your time. You know, take your time and only lift things half inch. Don't not even an inch at a time. You know, just be really really careful. <laughs> okay, because this machine is um, sitting on feet. Right. Than having a big cast iron base, right? You can't easily move it because you might crack those. You might crack those cast iron feet. Right, and the base is cast iron, which is brittle, so yeah, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. doesn't do impact. Yeah, well. so it's not good for for sliding. You know, you slide it along. You get 
hit a, you hit that. Hit a bump. Yeah. Crack, crack. <laughs> yeah, right. it just, it's just not worth the risk. So what, so, have, what have you built so here? Put, uh, these are six by six uh, skids. Okay. And, um, they look a lot like skis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just I just cut a little little angle there just to, to help get it over Up obstacles. And over Today's plan is to move this planer. John's made a sled for it. It weighs a lot and it's gonna go that way. comes back and down a lot, uh -huh, right? Yep. So actually the way it worked out well last time was the truck wasn't even really in the building. Just get back parallel right. to the door and then telescope your bed in. You know what, but we take this here, if we can, take it and like drag it out into the road and now back right to it and whip it up on the truck. We could do that too. attracting middle-aged men, get yourself a metal plane. The work John put into building the sled paid off in a big way. This was one of the easiest moves so far. Rolling. So today we are going to tackle this mezzanine. I want it down for safety reasons. I know it's cool, I love a shop with a mezzanine, but this one is, it's overstated, it's welcome, really. Little rotten, little sketchy, little wobbly. So before that happens, obviously I need to get this stuff out from underneath it. There are three or four machines that I, I that are in the way. Uh, I got a buffer, I got a vertical sander, I've got this um, turret lathe behind me, and then I've got a LeBlanc horizontal mill over there. Really nothing to it but to start moving and then then some demo. Everybody loves demo. This is a vertical belt sander. Those astute among us probably already figured that out. Uh, but the cool part about this is got this plaque on it that says war finish. A direct, as directed by order L100, United States War Production Board. So I'm not an expert, but what that tells me is that this was basically built for the war effort. And I'm assuming World War II, because it definitely doesn't look like World War I era. But that's pretty cool, man. I mean, this this machine was in a factory that likely helped us win the war, or help everyone else win the war. I'm not a war expert, okay? Metal, I'm assuming, was probably the focus of, of this machine. You know, putting a nice finish on, uh, on various metal parts. Sanding and filing was often the last um, operation in a milling production. You would mill the rough shape and then you would take it either to be filed with intolerance or you would take it to this to put a nice finish on it. So this is still a very usable tool in this shop. This whole bottom area would be full of like a coolant and then it would be pumped up. It looks like up into here where you have this valve. And so it would coat, likely coat the uh, sanding belt in some sort of coolant, probably to prolong the life 
of the belt and also keep the metal cold because when you're sitting here grinding on something for a while, the metal itself gets really hot. I've never seen a liquid cooled sander ever. So that's, that's pretty cool. I could be wrong, but that sound, that looks like that's what that is. Knife makers actually love these because this is perfect for putting an edge on a blade, doing that kind of thing. Uh, and I actually have some friends of mine who are knife makers, so that would be cool to collaborate on a knife with a uh, World War II era sander. So this one's not bolted down, I don't think. Nope. So uh, yeah, this is gonna stay in this shop. That's a really cool machine. Doesn't take up much space and uh, should be easy to move. So I'll disconnect the power and then we'll get her going. Okay. <laughs> what did Slow I do? Yeah. Something on the ground. Oh, oh there's look. a rock. That, the perfect wedge shape. That's what I hit. Come on. It's a miracle that didn't happen at some point with the other stuff. I mean, I guess it did, but. I got my heart going. <laughs> <laughs> I thought after all this like praising and talking about how much I love this sand, just just drop just it. Smash it on the ground. Ugh, man. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go a little slower. That's good. That's good advice. Okay, there's a hole there. Safety of the machine, I mean, not yourself. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah, if anything bad happens, it's like, is the machine okay? <laughs> so, if you'll, if you'll remember from when we were moving the bombshell lathe with, lathe with David, he had this rig where we could pick up and also pull at the same time. So. I'm gonna try to apply the same method here. Basically, there's no easy way to grab this thing with the two forks. It's got a solid base with no holes in it, and I can't get the forks wide enough to go out on either side of this uh, drip tray. So I'm gonna pick up underneath the table, and if I didn't do anything else, it would just tilt away from me and fall over. But what I'm also gonna do is chain this part to the back of the forklift. And so as I pick up and it tries to tilt away, the chain will keep that from happening. And hopefully I can pick the entire thing up, move it out of here and put it on a pallet. So let's try to apply some knowledge. So that's the David method. That's the David method. Well, if you don't, uh, if you don't listen to guys that are way smarter than you, what are you doing? <laughs> Cool. So we got it here in the middle and I've put it on a pallet. So obviously now it's a lot easier to move because pallets are, you know, standard for forklifts. So it's here in the light. And now that I can get a look at this thing, what it is, and I only know this because of some guys that have been in here before, people like David that drop knowledge. Uh, this is a turret lathe. And what it was used for, which was also aided in kind of the context of where it was, was they used it to make nuts and bolts. They used it to make fasteners from scratch. Around this machine was a lot of this stuff, you know, um, bar stock that's already hexagonal, like a bolt or the head of a nut. And so what they would do is feed it through here 
and then it would come out the other side and it's chucked up like a lathe. And so you would turn it on and it would start spinning. This has its own motor that's been retrofitted at some point. This was originally a line shaft machine. So originally this pulley would have been, been in the ceiling like some of the other machines. But what they did was they made a frame for it here and then they mounted the two line shaft bearings onto the machine itself. So you could put a much shorter belt on it and then you could hook it to a motor, thus making it something you could move around and power wherever you want. So that tells me this was probably done in the, probably the 40s or the 50s when electric motors became more prevalent in shops and um, it made more sense to start doing something like this. But what would happen on a machining standpoint is that the, the stock that you put in would come out here and you have this turret, and I believe that's probably why it's called a turret lathe. You have this deal you can move in and out. And on this turret, there's multiple operations. There's multiple tools. So there's a center drill, there's an actual drill, and then there's a tap. So if you think about a nut, a nut is basically just a section of this hexagonal rod that's been cut off, drilled, tapped, and then you cut it to length. So you would drill it, tap it, and then there's this piece here that would cut it to length. And so you, some guy could just sit here and crank out nuts or bolts or that kind of thing, which at a certain point in industry, I'm sure was a popular thing for someone to do. Obviously nowadays it makes absolutely no sense to make your own nuts or bolts because you can just go to the hardware store and get them, unless they're highly specialized, like a unique thread pattern or something like that. Um, which is probably what, this was used primarily for as time went on was just to make that otter end you know say you had to make a nut out of brass for instance or you had to make a nut and bolt that had a really odd thread pattern that's probably what this was used for for quite a long time and so being that that's the case it's really specialized and even more so today it's just basically obsolete because it is set up to do essentially one thing um, now you could customize this turret and the collets and, and be able to do a few different things with it, but compared to a normal lathe, it's much more uh, restricted on what it can do. So I don't really know what I'm gonna do with it. I don't really need it. Uh, it would be really cool to you know, find a home for this thing, to find somebody out there who has a need. Because I, I, you know, this is gonna be more or less a custom fabrication space. And I, I really don't foresee for the amount of space that this thing takes up, I really don't foresee needing to have it so bad, you know, to, to, to take up this much space. So, um, yeah, she's, we're looking for a home for it, um, but that's about as much as I know. You know, I'd love to hear if anybody out there really knows more about these things, um, you know, comment, let us know. So this appears to be a buffer or polisher of sorts. And uh, there's a motor down low. So electric motor that size probably means it's at least 1940s, 1950s, somewhere in there. But these bearings are old school. Basically these are grease caps. And how they work is they're threaded and you back them all the way up. And uh, what you do is hang in there, see what you do. <clears throat> you pack a bunch of grease in here and then you screw, actually you pack a bunch of grease in here in the cap and then you screw it onto this and over time, like every day or every week, you just turn it a little bit more and that forces grease into the bearing. So these are probably, I'm. I'm betting these were either early ball bearings or just bushings. So they were heavily, heavily reliant on grease. And I would imagine, I think there's still power on this. I'd imagine this thing spins pretty fast. never buffed 
anything before. Basically, you have buffing compound. It's kind of like buffing a car or anything, any kind of metal. These would be spinning, and you take the compound, which would kind of look like a like lipstick almost, like big lipstick, and you'd transfer some of the compound to the wheel, and then you take your metal or whatever, and you just go to town, buffing it up, and you would you would go through different grits and grains of buffing compound until you're left with something real shiny. But uh, man, this thing is this thing is alive. All this exposed belting. You got your three V belts for drive. And it looks like they took, this looks like a forge blower and they had some sort of dust extraction system going on. It looks like this would have been driven off the, the motor down there. And this is a big blower, except that they were using it backwards. They were sucking air through this ducting into here and then making it go, oh, it's like a filter bag. Oh no. Oh wow. Look at that. This is so old school. This may not even be safe or at all. <laughs> Machines work so much better when they're bolted to the ground. They don't move. Everything's more precise, dialed in. Although, when you go to move things, you gotta unbolt it. But it's all part of the fun. Buffing is still a thing and it's still largely the same as same mechanics as what this is, but This machine is huge the, the difference between this and a modern buffer is that the same job could be accomplished by a machine That's about this big and a machine that you could mount on a bench and I think the reason for that is that um, Electric motors have gotten so much better since the, the time that this machine was made that you don't need all this extra belting and pulleys and you know that that sort of thing they're much more powerful and much more efficient nowadays that basically it's just uh, modern buffers uh, just are just a motor and a buffing wheel attached to either side of the motor and they're no bigger than that and they sit on a belt so this still works great it's a little dangerous you know you got all this exposed whatnot and, um, but it's just big that's the only problem it takes up a lot of space so we may keep it we may not i don't know but i know for sure it's gotta move it's gotta move day's over. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's pretty good for day one, honestly. Um, got most of the stuff out from under here. The rest is just workbenches and desks, things that aren't going to take much time at all. Uh, these cool uh, parts bins back here will be, uh, hopefully they're not bolted to the wall. I have a sneaking suspicion that they might be, but still not that difficult. The, the last big thing that needs to go is this LeBlanc horizontal mill back here. Uh, it's just a big version of the brown and sharp I've got up front and that one needs a home too So we'll we'll talk about that one later and then I've just used this bench as a place to hold aluminum so all this stuff will move out pretty quickly tomorrow and then uh, Then we get to start figuring out how to kick the legs out from under this thing. We'll hit it again tomorrow. Thanks for watching Hey everybody welcome back to day two. This is my friend Wyatt. Say hello Wyatt. Hey Wyatt. Wyatt builds guitars works uh, at a uh, uh, real estate photography company as you've worked in the oil field before and mm -hmm. among of other things and many many honestly. The main attribute of yours that's crucial to today is that I was able to talk you into coming down here Huh? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> and helping me for this um, But uh, we are going to tackle the mezzanine. So yesterday I yeah. emptied most of everything out from underneath it There's a few more things. There's one big machine back there that we need yeah. to get to um, uh, and there are some interesting challenges with this mezzanine, mainly is that it's hanging from the I-beams, mm -hmm. not supported by columns like a deck. So we'll need to figure out how to deal with these little brackets. We use the forklift to support things so it doesn't all come crashing down at once. But that's basically the plan. So uh, let's just start moving stuff. Start moving stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Set 
17 foot long I beams. I look at things a little different, and I look at things usually in can we make something out of it? Things like little pieces like this, I got plenty of that scrap, but like threaded rod, like this kind of stuff, I'm gonna get a bucket. And uh, one of the ideas I have when we get up and running is to make little pieces of art, like uh, lamps and maybe sculptures out of all these bolts and threaded rods and things like that. So um, yeah, I'm keeping this kind of stuff for now. If it looks cool, literally that's my criteria. If it looks cool, just throw it in this bucket. Move this here for a second, clean that. Okay, then let's move it back over here. Clean that. Here's a question, should we pull them out and just dump them on the ground real quick to empty them while we're making a mess or should we just worry about that later? We'll worry about that later. All right, let me find a place to put them that doesn't suck. Spins were, well, as you see, they were all along the wall here, but the, um, it's hardware. So every shop should have a place where they can store hardware. And if you buy nuts or bolts or things for a, a project and you don't use all of them, you need to have a place to put it all for later use. So there was all kinds of stuff in here. Rivets, uh, Allen hardware, um, a bunch of this square headed lag stuff. I mean, this sort of fastener really dates this whole shop. You know, square heads, there's a date attached to every feature on this fastener that I'm not keen to, but that thread pattern and that head is at least 50, 60 years old before this was out, probably more. I mean, this is what they built cabins, buildings out of in the 1800s. So maybe add a zero to that. <clears throat> but anyway, point is it's old and I'm dumb and I don't know facts. So, uh, <laughs> It's let's go ahead and admit it. This yeah. one, yeah, let's just get, yeah. let's get the YouTube <laughs> comments address right now. I don't I know, know anything. Old. I know how to build stuff and I was terrible at history. So yeah. Historically that thing is old. Yeah. Got it's it. it's exactly old. Old. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. No one got shocked, no one got hurt. Uh, we did it. Don't try this at home. Everybody likes a little demo. Classic roll top, roll top desk. It still works. It's actually in really good shape. So this I might take down to Black Dog and see if uh, it's got some value there. It's certainly, certainly still a usable, fully functioning piece of furniture. And it looks like it's all oak oak uh, veneer, at least here, but this looks like solid oak. So, it's a nice piece. Yeah, look at that. Quarter yeah. sawn oak, man. Oh, cool, a fishing uh, scale. Portable fishing scale. That's cool. That should be a machine shot. Yeah, well, this is usable for all kinds of things. We get it, you need attention. What on earth is that? 
may not want the answer to that. That's a, oh, that's a little... Tweet, 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 tweet. A little grabulator. A little grabulator. <laughs> it's a grabulator. Here, have yourself a good old grabulator. Do some grabulating. Meh. Meh, meh. This channel is doomed. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, why in the world do these, the joint of bone and joint surgery, there's a ton of them. Aren't they great? 58, 56. There's what some machine shop needs joint and bone surgery. There is some gruesome stuff in here. Well, it's funny you say that because they used to make, um, they used to make pins and plates uh, for crazy uh, leg bone fractures. Here? Yeah. Well, so I found some interesting correspondence between the machinist and the steel factory. Yeah. Trying to find the right alloy of steel that wouldn't like no. rust inside the leg and everything. Right. I would love to find something to make a lamp or a, or a piece of art or maybe what I thought about doing was I have a bunch of these old price sheets somewhere, but like make a frame by welding these together that I could frame yeah. some of these with the, the, the parts themselves. Cause this is, I'm assuming this is all weldable, but I don't know. I have no idea what alloy this is, but right. anyway, so, um, so cool. they, they worked between, uh, a, basically the ma machinist had to know to a degree what was involved in surgery like this. So hmm. they kind of had to have a lot of crossover and knowledge between the, the doctor and the machinist and the steel alloy expert to come up with an effective solution to uh, bone fractures. But like, yeah, we're to 1956. We're talking way before computers were ever involved. That's so cool. Yeah. Okay, you are officially decommissioned. It looks like this air compressor, which is so cool. This old Westinghouse motor, they're really inefficient, but just incredibly quiet, super old, and just, just gorgeous. Oh my gosh, this is great. Um, uh, the V pump here. But anyway, this has got air moving into this whole section, and they've got it, it rigged up to where you can run air along the entire shop. So, it's lovely. I'm so happy that they've got a union right here. That way we can undo the union, undo the electric, which is already shut off. Thank you, Tag. Um, and uh, we should be able to get this thing right on out. This is a horizontal milling machine. Some call it a universal milling machine uh, or gear cutting machine, any of that. This is made by a company called LeBlond. Um, I don't know how old it is, but I know that it was originally made to be line driven because it's got this stepped cone pulley back here that actually drives the mechanism. And what someone had, has done probably in the 19, 40s, based on the age of this uh, motor, somewhere between the 20s and 40s, they retrofitted an, a standalone electric motor on top of it so it could be just plugged into the wall and not have to derive its power mechanically from the ceiling. So what it does primarily, uh, people use these to cut gears, to act, literally make gears from scratch. And so this cutter head here will have, this profile represents the profile of each tooth in yeah. a gear. And so this piece here is called the dividing head. And this disc with all the holes in it is essentially an early form of programming. You would use various pattern, concentric patterns of holes on this ring to program a 20 tooth gear or a 15 tooth gear or a 30 tooth gear. And you'd cut your tooth, you'd turn this a specific number of rotations or part of one rotation and then you'd cut another tooth. And you could you could uh, put an infinite number of cutters on here. You could 
This piece actually here has been handmade by somebody here for some specific purpose, I'm sure. But uh, Brett Davis, actually the guy that bought the Bullard, his shop in uh, Columbia, Pennsylvania, he still actively uses a horizontal mill yeah. like this. And he sent me a video of it the other day, which we'll put here. Let's pull it out of the hole. Uh, long term, I want to clean it up and list it, find a home for it. Yeah. But for now, let's get it out of harm's way. The conduit for all the lighting is very much still attached to the mezzanine. So why? That's the box, right, that feeds basically the rest of it. I'll shut the power off and then uh, you're ready to pull the conduit, then we can start ripping. There you go. Maximum safety achieved. I guess there's certain things you get kind of numb to in life. And I guess one of the things I'm used to is destruction via heavy equipment. <laughs> Well, as you can see, we've achieved something very drastic here today. Yeah. Uh, I had, I mean, this building just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And that's not to say it's not increasing in physical size, but the more Space. of this type of stuff we oh, do. Oh, man. This was a, this absolutely needed to happen. This thing was dangerous. You can really start to see yeah. the condition of the wood here. It was real rotten. Um, and I think uh, that was a good system we came up with. a great with. system. So. Uh, hey, you got all. Ten fingers and toes? I'm good. You do? Yeah. I do too. So we'll do some things. We'll tidy up the electrics. We'll make sure everything's capped off and, and turned off and terminated. Um, really just need to cut this into smaller pieces and, and get it out, get it into a dump trailer and take yep. it to the dump. So let's go home. I'm tired. Sounds good. <laughs> so it's now time to really start thinking about building renovation and uh, the, everything left in here at the moment, I wanna keep, but obviously it cannot be in here when we redo the floor, and put a wall down the center of this building, it needs to go somewhere else. And I have been racking my brain trying to figure out where's it gonna go and how I'm gonna get it there. Dale, the, the, one of our partners in this project, owns some buildings in Venton, which is about 15 minutes away. Um, vacant, big, 
big buildings that could definitely house all this stuff, but that means we gotta rent a forklift uh, to put it on the other end of that. Last night, I was talking to Dale, and he said, why don't you ask somebody on Roarer here if they have uh, some space, you know, because I'm good friends with Connor and Jerry next door at Groves. I went and talked to Jerry first thing. He actually owns another building that's four buildings down that's basically empty. So this morning, Jerry gave me the key to a basically empty building that he owns um, and said that uh, you can use a corner of it. So I finally have a plan and it feels really, really good. Hey, Jay! Hey, man. What's going on? Jerry, next door at Groves Automotive, he's got a bunch of stuff in there and he needs shelving. Oh. So Dale owns a building in Venton that's, it was an old hardware store that's full of shelving <laughs> that he needs to get rid of. <laughs> Intertwine the pieces yeah. of happiness. So if we go that's to that great. building and get the shelving, give it to them and help them organize their stuff, not only does it get their stuff out of the way, but it's payment for my use of the building. It's awesome. Today, I'd like to do one last pass and get rid of the rest of the scrap metal okay. and trash. Okay. So this guy's geared up. Uh, I've got all the, the conduit in there right now from the mezzanine. Mm -hmm. This guy's ready to just get loaded full of metal and uh, we can head off to the scrap yard today. Something out of uh, Hills Have Eyes. Well, no, that's uh. Yeah, that looks like some post apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, what's Fallout. the horror movie? Fallout, yeah. Uh, Mad Max? Mad Max. Yeah, it looks like, yeah. Mad Max Waterworld. Yeah, Mad Max Waterworld. This? <laughs> I'm loving this mechanic. Let's oh, just keep it. That that it's cool. That's rad. <laughs> Two on Roar Avenue in Roanoke. Um, I have the keys to the space down the road. Uh, Wyatt and I uh, this weekend brought the shelves over to the space. There's about 10 shelves in there. Let's take a walk. For some reason, I really enjoy organization. So this is what I did this weekend. Today's mission is to finish up this area, probably push everything closer to the wall and clean out that corner. And I would like to, by the end of the day, have a few pieces moved from the machine shop over here. Let's, let's drive down the street.
doing something for a change. So this is after two hours really of just moving stuff. I got turret lathe, wood stove, uh, buffer, belt sander, press, and Sebastian lathe moved in two hours. That is a perfect example of how much easier this is going to be now that I can just drive it down the street instead of having to load it into a truck. This would have taken an entire day if I had to truck it somewhere else. So good first day. I mean, this place looks cleaner even with all my stuff in it now than it did this morning. So I think I'm making the neighbors happy and I'm making myself happy. Let's close up. That's a good day. See you tomorrow. Back at it, day three. Day three. Uh, we're gonna move this big boy here. We're gonna move the bridge port. We're gonna move the surface grinder. Ideally, we're gonna move just about everything today. As much of the big tools yeah. large machinery as we can. We've already got the electricity decommissioned off of these. Yeah. Um, so everything's tight, right, and safe. Mm -hmm. It's good. No shocking. 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 So we got 16 feet overall. Yeah. We're gonna have to bring this thing out and then out the door. So. We can use that crane over there to pick that end up to move it in this direction like it. because those wheels can't turn. So yeah. once we get it out, then we'll go straight out. I discovered an issue with the rig and that's when this side's on wheels as it is, as soon as we go over the crest right there at the entryway of the door and it starts going downhill, momentum or gravity is going to shove this thing into the forklift. I'm going to lead out with the forklift and as these wheels go over that crest, it's going to shove it into the forklift. So we're going to get Wyatt's truck in here and we're going to tie this end to his truck. So as we go out the door, he can kind of hold it back and he can be the brakes for it to keep it from ramming into the forklift. I need more coffee. Coffee is good. You don't want your little, you don't want your little head hurt. We'll get, we'll take care of you. Why, did you see our Christmas card? No. So, uh, we need to communicate effectively. And, uh, so windows down. Yep. Um, Exhaust on maximum quiet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the flow masters off. Okay. We'll stick potatoes in the mufflers. <laughs> about to go over the over the crest so in that case why don't you keep a little tension on it and I'm gonna go super slow so maybe you should compensate for me okay The only thing was it's real uneven right there, so I wasn't sure if the uh, these small wheels was gonna wobble too much, but it came straight out. This road's smooth, so we're smooth sailing now.
end of day three on the move and uh, this was the biggest hurdle um, because everything that has happened here was done with just us two and a forklift. Yeah. So this was the biggest thing like that I was worried about because we didn't have, we don't have any experts with us. You know, we don't have any of those guys, you know, we don't have Brett, we don't have Bobby Fisher, we don't have any of that uh, old expertise around. So I'm happy with I'm how old things. old expertise. I am the yeah. old expertise. <laughs> Why it's 30, what? Three. Three? Almost 34. He is though the resident old man on the team. But yeah. anyway, day three, lots done. Um, really the only thing left to move is uh, workbenches. And we got three forklift sized machines over, uh, over at the other warehouse. That's true. We got the bridge port still to yep. move. We got the surface grinder. We got the brown and sharp. Okay, so there's a little bit. All of those should be able to be moved with a forklift. Yeah, palletize them yeah. and just move them. So yeah. this was a big hurdle and uh, smooth sailing from here. So let's go home. Just keep walking. Keep walking. Okay. And fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> Today is the day that I plan on doing the remaining bit of the work uh, involved in emptying this place out. Got a few machines left to move, a bunch of pallets and crates and boxes worth of things, but as you have already seen, I've got a storage solution figured out just down the street. So I'm um, gonna do a little bit more cleaning, a little bit more organizing, and uh, get to moving. last of the major stuff. The shop is basically empty and we are ready to get an architect in here and or in there, not here. It's not my building. And uh, come up with a plan, get, get this thing moving. So moved everything. We didn't break anything in the process, which was key. There were some, there were some tense moments. The entryways to these warehouses are a little sketchy, but everything made it, nothing fell. Uh, so all I got to do is move it back to that building without breaking it. Uh, and then we'll be, we'll be home free. But this represents a lot of work behind me. Uh, mostly by myself, some with Wyatt, but um, more or less one man band. So to be able to achieve something like this with basically one forklift and one of me, because trust me, that's all the world needs is one of me. Uh, that's, I, I feel pretty, pretty good about that. So onward. Whiskey time. Whiskey time.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Tay Whiteside, and I'm here in a 100-year-old machine shop in downtown Roanoke. For those of you that have seen the Machine Shop YouTube channel, you are familiar with how it got to this point, at least for the most part. A lot of work has been happening uh, recently. Um, but for the past year, I've been kind of lost. I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Might be the right word in uh, the bureaucracy of getting a renovation permit for the space. You know I don't speak Spanish. In English, please. Again, the, the point of this project is to turn this building into uh, my custom fabrication studio, studio and uh, video production office. All right, we're all duly impressed. I kept a lot of the old machines from the space, a lot of the belt-driven machines, a lot of the motor-driven machines lathes there's a 12 foot lathe six foot lathe but as you can tell the building's basically clear uh walk you around this is a 4,000 square foot building that was built in 1917 uh, located right here in downtown roanoke a block from uh, big lake brewing and uh, tuco's i'm hungry let's get a taco which is very convenient i might add it is the new year it is january 8th or 9th 2020 and uh, it's time to do something. The plan is to build an office in this front corner up here, uh, which will be the video production office and conference room, move a bathroom up here. Me and your mama did it in a Rustler Steakhouse bathroom when I was 17. And then the rest of the space, at least for the time being, is gonna be open. Uh, and I can fill it however I want with cut, you know, tools and work benches and things like that. So metalworking, woodworking, uh, you know, the plan originally was to put a wall down the middle and separate the two spaces. I'll probably still do that, but I don't exactly know how much space I want to dedicate to each side. So why put a wall in if I don't know where it's gonna go yet? As you can tell, it's pretty dirty still. Dennis, got some lovely filth down here. Uh, we gotta deal with the walls. The walls are filthy. And uh, we gotta deal with the electrics. We gotta rip a lot of the old electric conduit and sketchy wiring out of the ceiling. I've got two electrical panels at Black Dog down the road that we salvaged from a commercial shopping center in Maryland. Uh, they're two big, um, two 25 amp boxes. So that'll be plenty to power the whole shop. We do have a permit, a renovation permit from the city, so it might as well start working. All right, first things first, you guys gotta type some of this shit out and get organized for Christ's sake. Uh, I got a buddy of mine, Wyatt. You guys remember Wyatt from uh, the Machine Shop episode where we took down the mezzanine and a few other things. He's coming by today to help me with uh, last scrap run, and then we will also be dealing with this, um, this pile of scrap wood, which was Basically old workbenches and shelves and stuff like that. That's a lot of rambling. Hopefully some of that helps you bring up the speed. I know it's been a long time since we did another video or since we posted a video and um, sorry about that. But again, that's life. Look everybody, it's Wyatt. Nice. Like I said, we're gonna do a scrap run today and I think it's gonna be the last scrap run of the- uh, Machine shop? Well, the phase one. Yeah. I'll There's make scrap later. There's always more scrap run. Yeah. But we're using the uh, the gantry system that was in the shop. It's a really cool chain hoist, and we just put the scrap in barrels and cut holes in the side. And Bob's your uncle. Bob is my uncle. Take it. All right. So after about a half day of work, Wyatt and I got the last big load of scrap to the scrap yard. This corner is now relatively clear, which is going to be where the office goes. Sewer update. Yay, everybody's favorite part of the video. <clears throat> so this building is more or less a rectangle and the sewer, you can tell I'm walking to the back of the building, came out or is, is here. And in this back corner, there was probably the most disgusting bathroom that I've uh, ever seen. Wyatt, how, how was that bathroom? How was it? Yeah. It was decrepit, it was like, it was, it was horrendous. So the pooper was there and there was a sink here and I dug this out to figure out where the sewer was going. And I was hoping, being that the bathroom was gonna be rerouted up front, then I'm standing here in the back of the shop, front over there, back right here. And as you can see, 
it continues into the ground that way, which is toward the front. Yay. Meaning there is a chance that if we dig out all the dirt that is for some reason in the corner of the shop by the electric panels, there's a chance we can hit the existing sewer line, which would be amazing because I need to tap into it and run it over to where I want the bathroom to be. If you guys follow that, some of it made sense. So uh, if you like digging a hole, but there's a chance if we dig under here, we might find a sewer line. I just don't know how far I gotta dig because keep in mind, sewers need to have drop. So back there, the sewer was maybe a foot and a half under the slab. Oh, you got a great point. I hate the point you're about to make. That means over here it could be two or three feet underground. What have we found so far? We're looking for a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> There's gonna be some, some bones in this here. Bones could have been on Jenny. Or who was that guy? Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy, I bet Jimmy Hoffa's body's buried down in here. If the pipe is here, it's gonna be deeper than the pipe over there. But by how much? Now that, folks, is the golden question. Or where it is. <laughs> or if it's even right here. It could be right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah what if it's... What if we're digging here, which we are, and the pipe is there? Aren't you excited? I'm gonna get that T-Rex in this. Well, we haven't hit anything and the hole's pretty deep. We dug about two feet down, sewer's not there. There's a lot more ground that we should probably open up. I think it's about time I find a uh, mini excavator. Yeah, yeah, that would have been better. Well, hey, you know, thanks for any, thanks anyway. Yeah, so see you this weekend at my house? <laughs> He's got to dig a trench. And so uh, I think <laughs> I know who's going to help him. <laughs> anyway, um, that's all I got for today. Yeah. See ya. Hi everybody. Back here at the machine shop and today I have a plumbing update for you. The plan is to relocate the bathroom from where it was back in that corner. I'll throw in some uh, footage here of Wyatt and I destroying the old bathroom. It was disgusting. Uh, and I'm gonna move it up to the front of the building over there. To move a bathroom, you have to move a few things. You have to move sewer, you have to move water, and um, you have to build the bathroom. You have to do the walls, the fixtures, toilet, all that sort of thing. Thanks to Lynn Horn, uh, a local plumber, she is a badass. What she did was put her fancy camera down where, down in the sewer where the toilet was and ran it. You know, I dug this hole out here to see where it goes and I knew it went that way because <clears throat> you can see down there. But she ran it that way to see where the sewer went. Lucky for me, it went straight. Just like a lot of these old buildings tend to do, uh, it's all sectioned cast iron pipe. And I dug a hole here a few weeks ago with Wyatt, hoping you know, if I dug the same distance off the wall as it is back there, hoping I would find it. I didn't find anything, so I got a little discouraged. That's why I called Lynn. She put her camera in, and in fact, the sewer pipe was just a little to the left of where I was digging. So we found it. It is right there. And now I need to dig a trench from here, since I'm already down, over to where I want the bathroom to be, just about where that yellow cord is. The plan is to find a starting point, find an end point, uh, reference the plans, uh, draw two parallel lines with spray paint, and then I'm gonna use this concrete saw to cut along the outer parallel lines, and then I'll break up the concrete and then bring a mini excavator in here with a 12 inch bucket. These lines are 16 inches apart, and uh, 
we'll dig out the concrete and then the plumber who I talked to this morning, he's gonna come in and actually grade the trench so that uh, poop flows downhill. There's no water in this building yet. So I have access to these big totes. Um, you know, they're off cast from fertilizer companies or whatever, they only kind of use them once. So this one's been professionally cleaned, so there's no fertilizer on the inside anymore. And I took it down to the local fire department and uh, had them fill it with water. Didn't know you could do that. So if you're looking to get a big container or something filled with water, go talk to your local first responders. They're usually pretty nice about it. So I can gravity feed the water from this tank to the water supply for the concrete saw, which will help keep the dust down. So these saws are interesting. It's like this little flop out wheel with a washer on it that I can use to help me guide the cut. I can see over the engine and do that. You crank this wheel down and it lowers the blade into the concrete. And the water, the dust system was a little broken, so I hooked the hose from my tank up to here where there's a valve, which is nice. And then I just wired this hose to the side of the blade guard. And I did a little test cut. It seems to be spraying in the right spot. So I should be able to keep my dust down. This thing is loud. I'm gonna put some ear protection in. But man, it hogs through some concrete. So this should, uh, should do what I need it to do pretty quick. Well, that was kind of fun. Those saws make quick work of a lot of work. And it turns because, you know, in plumbing, you either have a 90 or a 45 degree turn. And for sewer, I think it's only 45. So we get a 45 cut this way, and then it'll do another 45 and open up to where everything's gonna be. So now I just gotta chip up this concrete. I ran down to a plumbing supply place near me that I happened to notice earlier today, rents this thing out. Uh, and I got it for 50 bucks a day and the weekend's free. It's Friday. That means if I need it all weekend, I've only paid 50 bucks. It's a pretty sweet deal. It's a big boy. Big DeWalt. I got three tips. Probably use that pointy one there. But uh, yeah, hopefully this big hammer will make quick work of uh, this little trench. Enjoy a montage. chipped up. I was going back over some of the stuff. I switched bits. I switched to that wide bit. Going back over some things. I'm gonna get out of here and uh, tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, I'll be getting the uh, Mini X from Dale's place in Benton and bringing it over here and we're gonna have some fun. It's gonna be great. See you then. <sighs> okay, it's Saturday morning, about 8.30 and I was told there'd be an excavator, excavator, here waiting for me. And uh, it's not here yet. It's cold, I haven't had that much coffee. Uh, I was told to be here. So it's a waiting game, but hopefully an excavator shows up soon and uh, I can start playing with it. Well, it happened so suddenly uh, that I forgot to film it, the guy was the guy that dropped this thing off was uh, getting a little frustrated with how the roads in downtown Roanoke were leading him astray and was like, get this thing off of here as soon as, I, as soon as you can and get me out of here. So I said, yes, sir. But needless to say, it's here now. We've got a nice little case mini excavator. Um, unfortunately, the guy that dropped it off did not get the memo about the 12 inch bucket and it has a two foot uh, bucket on it. And uh, now I gotta go to Southeast Roanoke and uh, 
pick up the small bucket and bring it here before I can use it. I'm back from Southeast. I got the small bucket. And now I gotta take the big bucket off, put the small bucket on. Go drive these two pins out, set it down. Of course, this pin is held in by a bolt, which is a bit seized, so that's gonna be fun. Uh, but we'll take it out, we'll grease the pins when we put them back in, and then uh, hopefully we'll be up in action. There's always like four or five steps when you think there's gonna be one step. Look who it is. I'm, I'm, I'm awake. Mister, I'm up till one playing the guitar in yeah. some other town. Yeah, pretty much. Morning. Morning. At this point, I think everyone has seen the part of the video where you and I were digging for China. Yeah, yeah. We're looking for a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> we were six inches off. Mother. Uh, we were there. The sewer line is right there. You see it? Yep. I see it. People with tools, yeah. like real tools. She made a point to tell me though that it was a six thousand dollar camera. Yeah, I believe it. And I was like, that's not what I'm paying for well, the service. Yeah, it's a twenty dollar show. So. Yeah, right, right. Okay, welcome back. It is mid-February. It is a Friday. It's Valentine's Day. And um, here is a little update with the machine shop. So I uh, got the trench dug and the plumber came in and did all the underground plumbing for the new bathroom location, which is over there. Uh, called the inspector, it passed inspection. So now I'm bedding it in with a little bit of dirt and then I'm about to go to a quarry and get a trailer load of gravel to bury everything and, and fill the trench back in, bring it back up to the slab level, which will be great because then I can pour concrete on top of it. I'm still trying to figure out how to pour concrete over the entire building. I think it's in the budget, but I have to sacrifice a few other things in order to be able to afford that. But I think really that's gonna be worth it in the long run. So because of that, I can fill the gravel all the way up to the level of the, the current slab. That way I can drive things in and out of the building and there's not a huge ditch right here. I need to pressure wash the ceiling. So being able to get the scissor lift around in the building and not being limited by this big, you know, crevice in the floor is gonna be a big help. Existing sewer goes out that way. Uh, and then the pipe runs up this way. Takes a 45 left, takes a 45 right. And then the big ones for the toilet, the small ones for the shower. And these two are for sinks, one inside the bathroom, one on the outside wall of the bathroom, which will be my utility cleanup sink for when I come in from working in the shop. All oh, that's good. Got a new water line run from the meter, which will come up through the wall behind the shower and then supply water to the rest of the bathroom and then probably a hose bib or something on the outside wall in the shop area so that I have water in the shop. So yeah, passed our first building inspection. Milestone. Uh, the electrician was by this morning to finish up the panel install. Show you guys that now. Uh, we got a 225 amp panel and we got a 125 amp panel. These were salvaged from a commercial location in Maryland when I was working with Black Dog. So got them for a pretty good deal and they are 220 three phase, which is perfect. That's what I have on the building. They're all hooked up. He came by this morning and put this slick grounding bar in, hammered a ground bar into the ground and he put in a test GFCI socket. So all we need now is the inspector to come by and approve it. And then we can get AEP to turn the power back onto the building. And then we officially have water, power, and sewer. Starting to get the basics figured out, guys. It's pretty exciting. I'm about to go to a local quarry uh, with a dump trailer 
pick up a trailer load of gravel. And hopefully, if I don't fill the whole trench in with that load, hopefully I can at least fill this section in so that I can drive in and out and be able to access things and get a lift over here because I got to work on that part of the ceiling. It's exciting. Here we go. All right, here we go. Back from the quarry. Riding a little low. Got two tons of 57s. So we're going to back it in here and get it pretty close to the trench. And then this thing dumps. So I'll be able to dump it back just enough to where I can slide it out into the trench. And I kind of wish I had a skid steer for this, but I got a shovel. So have shovel will spread gravel. That is tricky. I've done this with this trailer before, but not with two tons of gravel in the back. So Jerry, my neighbor, came out to help me back it in. But I'm in a great spot. I should be able to dump it right over the hole and uh, just spread it from there. Let's do that. Betting at home how far two tons of 57 gravel would go. You guessed eight feet of the trench. You were right. I knew, you know, based on my truck and trailer limitations that I could only take two, two and a half tons because my truck can haul 9,000. The trailer can hold, well, 12,000 total, but 8,000 when you subtract the weight of the trailer. Roughly leaves me four or 5,000 pounds. I think 3,750. So I could only really take two tons and, um, I think in total I need 10 tons if I did all my volumetric calculations for the trench correctly. But it's not the end of the world because now I can at least get things in and out of the building because I filled in this part of the trench here. So that's a good, of a, good enough milestone for me because now I can get equipment in and out of the building to work on the ceiling. So we're gonna put a pin in the gravel trench filling situation and move on to the next phase which is the ceiling. So I've been thinking about insulating the ceiling. It's a bladder roof. So the right way to insulate is to put a layer of insulation in between the roof structure and the rubber bladder. But when they did the roof on this place, they did not put the insulation in between the bladder and the roof. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not insulated. It's just not very well insulated. You know, it's got a few layers of rubber up there that does something, but it doesn't do what real insulation would do. So that's why I was thinking to put insulation on the inside and the ceiling, but then you lose the cool architectural value of the ceiling. The wooden structure is really cool looking, and uh, I'd like to retain that because it's part of the character of the building. So we're just going to go with it. We're not going to insulate. We're going to rely on whatever's already there. Whether or not I put an HVAC unit in the building to heat the rest of the building outside of the office. Uh, time will tell, I can always do that later. So because I'm not covering the ceiling, now I want to clean it. So I have a pressure washer. A friend of mine who's a developer uh, did it in a building in Venton, which is county over, where he pressure washed the roof, the ceiling structure of the building, and it looked great. Uh, got rid of all the dirt and you know grime and really livened the wood up. So I'm gonna try the same thing here. The problem is it's pretty miserable. Uh, I'm gonna be on this scissor lift and I have my pressure washer and I have my tank of water, which now has about 125 gallons in it. It's about halfway used. I'm gonna try it out in the corner of the shop here. You can kind of see the ceiling structure, what I'm working with, and we'll see what comes off. I'm gonna put a rain suit on head to toe face mask, the whole deal, just so that I don't get soaked. Because again, it's mid-February, and if I get soaked in water, I'm gonna be freezing. So we're gonna give that a shot and uh, see how it works out. probably the most awful thing I've ever done in my life. Come again? What a terrible job. 
layered up, spraying right over my head, God knows what falling on me. I'm fairly well protected. And luckily the water is keeping the dust down, so I'm not, you know, in danger of breathing a whole lot. But man, I mean, you can barely see, I guess you can see the difference. I mean, that's clean. That's not so clean. I wasn't really running a timer, <clears throat> but I only did one, two, three, four, four spaces in joists right there. I went through about 75 gallons of water doing that, and it probably took an hour. So with that kind of math, it's gonna take me quite a while to do this building. Wow, I mean, that dirt is really, really in there. Okay, and we're back. More gravel uh, intake is going on today. I uh, went to the quarry again and picked up two and a half tons of 57s, which is what they call this type of gravel, just like normal gravel. Not sure what the 57 means, but I was told by people I trust, go get 57s. And I was like, okay. Don't be so gullible, McFly. Uh, if you're wondering what I'm hauling with, this is a big tex dump trailer that I borrowed from uh, Black Dog. There's some interesting math that has to happen to figure out how much you can haul. I have a 9,000 pound towing capacity. The trailer itself, if you look, the difference between 12,000 pounds and the net payload 8250 is 3750. Uh, so the trailer itself weighs 3750. Subtract that from nine, you know, you can only really haul five and a half thousand pounds. So I went to the quarry and asked for two and a half tons, and um, that's what I got. Doesn't look like it, but that's two and a half tons of gravel. Last time I filled enough of the trench with gravel so that I can drive things in and out, which is obviously helpful right now. The power is back on. Another fun development. I got my panels in. But today, um, this corner of the roof up here needs some work. And right now there's a big hole here. So there's no equipment or anything that can get to the corner of the shop. So I borrowed a Bobcat. It's nice to know people. An old trusty Bobcat with a flat blade um, bucket on it. So I'm gonna dump the gravel right here. I'm gonna fill this hole over here first. And then whatever's left, I will continue to fill the trench this way. And I've got, it doesn't look like much, but there's a, there's a lot of trench to fill. And when I, when I did my math before, I think I needed about 10 cubic yards. And a cubic yard of gravel weighs about a ton and a half. So someone do the math. It's gonna take a few more trailer loads, I think, to fill up the whole trench. But with all that said, uh, let's dump. forward with the trailer up so that the rest of this comes out. Um, a little sketchy. Hopefully I don't have to drive forward much because pretty close to the ceiling over there. So we're going to do that. It's just time to spend some time in the bobcat get this pile of gravel into that hole and then however much i can get over that way but this hole right here is the priority so cue the montage <laughs> about as much as I could with the bobcat and then as you saw I had to come in with the hand shovel just trying to get it flattened out I still don't think a scissor lift with tiny wheels would be able to drive into this corner until it's super packed down but even then it might get stuck but at least there's no big hole here and I packed this out a little bit more because as you drive over it it gets beaten down that's as far as two and a half tons got me I filled in that hole 
and a little bit more of this trench over here. This hole is pretty big over here, about eight by six feet, about a foot and a half deep at its deepest. Then I got this little piece and that little piece. So I'm gonna do one more trailer load today. Hopefully it gets the majority of this open section uh, filled in. And uh, then I'm going to a comedy show tonight with some friends. Shout out Nate Bargatze, rad comedian coming to Roanoke, playing at the Berglund Center. Super stoked to go see him. Uh, by the time this video comes out, he will have already played. Follow him, super funny. I saw him on The Degenerates, I believe, on Netflix. So check him out. Anyway, I'm gonna try to squeeze one more trip to the quarry in today before I go have some fun. So here we go. So <clears throat> I'm in downtown Roanoke. The quarry is off of 220. If you're not from Roanoke or Virginia for that matter, none of this makes any sense, but it's about 20 minutes away, a little less, about 15, 16, 17 minutes away. Um, and let's see, two and a half tons costs uh, $48 for two and a half tons of gravel. But here we go, tow mode on, heading to the quarry. So I'll see you guys when we get there. Alrighty, here we are, Rockydale. Quarries are awesome. I mean, just looking into a quarry has always been fascinating to me. How big of a hole, I mean, it is. It is a giant hole. Look at this. I mean, where do rocks come from? They come from the ground, in case anybody was confused about that. I mean, look at that hole. So I'm here getting 57s, which is a type of gravel. Um, I'm gonna be honest, the first time I came here, it was a bit intimidating because Every other truck that's here picking up gravel is like a giant dump truck, you know, like with three, four axles. They know what they're doing. Everyone's moving fast. And when you come to a place like this the first time, like the signs aren't super clear. You don't really know what to do or where to go. Um, but usually with places like this, you know, they weigh you when you're coming in and then they weigh you when you're going out so that they know and obviously they subtract the difference in the two weights and that's how they calculate how much gravel you were served. Uh, although you request a certain amount, in this case I'm gonna ask for two and a half tons, uh, they still weigh you just in case the guy over or under served you. So yeah, now I talk to this lovely lady here at the scale house and ask for two and a half tons. Be right back. Alrighty, and so you tell her, and then she radios to the guy that's running the big loader, uh, and it is a huge loader. So he, she radios to him, and then the part that's fascinating to me is they must have a scale built in to the hydraulic system on those loaders because the guy, I see him when he takes a scoop, he's like shaking out a little bit here, a little bit there obviously trying to get to the right amount of weight of gravel. And like, they are accurate. Last time it was only 0.1 over. I asked for two tons, he gave me 2.1. So that, that's pretty impressive when you see the size, but yeah, this is the quarry. So here's 57s on the left. What I do is I pull in and sort of back in. And then when the loader gets done doing whatever he's doing, he will come back to me and dump it in. Next time you're working on a home renovation project and you need to get a lot of gravel, just know it is not nearly as complicated as you think. And it's actually pretty cheap. Here he comes, look at this, look at this big loader. thing is huge and he's like measuring it looks like he got it he dumps it in the 
the truck sits down a little bit and he beeps twice and we're out so yeah that's how you get gravel now we're gonna weigh out and um, get back to the machine shop open this door up this door is just big enough to fit this trailer in you can see I've kind of tagged this thing once or twice but here we go back in the shop it's the end of February a few things have happened since we last saw you past our electrical inspection two nice big power boxes all wired up and happy to go that's a 225 amp that one's a 125 amp but uh, yesterday uh, had a team of framers in here to fix some structural issues with the ceiling the roofer needs to come by and patch some leaks it's a rubber bladder membrane roof but there were parts of the ceiling that were just compromised to the point where if you were walking on the roof in the wrong spot you might fall through so had to address those for sure and i wanted to do that before the roofer came to fix the leaks but one of the biggest problems was this corner this corner was sagging about four or five inches and um causing water to pool uh, on the roof and uh, it was also leaking in this corner uh, now that the structure has been fixed I can get the roofer to patch the corner up on the roof I'm not sure what it is probably something minor it's a really slow leak this corner here had a similar problem not quite as bad got it patched and then a select few other places we just had to um, put some plywood up and then cut some 2 by 10s to support the plywood just places where the ceiling structure was falling in and the bladder was exposed. Ideally, if we had the money, you know, we'd pull the bladder off the entire roof, you know, fix all the wood from the top and then put a new bladder over top. But you know, that's a twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 ordeal. And unfortunately the previous owners of this building put a new bladder roof over old wooden structure. Kind of forced me into the position I'm in because it's a shame to waste the good bladder. You know so we did what we could by fixing it underneath you can see here more of the patching just went through about a dozen two by tens and four sheets of three quarter inch plywood just tightening up a few spots it's not very good looking but you know i'll i'll paint it black or flame burn it or something you know just to make it go away because the plan is to still pressure wash this ceiling um in this corner i already started you can see the difference not pressure washed pressure washed this one corner though because of how intricate the ceiling design is took me you know every bit of 45 minutes so it is going to be a laborious task for sure today's plan however has a little bit more to do with the line shaft the line shaft as you may have seen is still in this building and for those that, that don't know the line shaft is how they would power old pieces of equipment uh, real quick overview of this one. I have some old footage that I'll put in of it running. Uh, that is a hundred year old Westinghouse electric motor, three phase, and it turned this big drive pulley, which turned this entire shaft. So basically this whole shaft would be spinning all day and various machines would be, power would come to the shaft, to a pulley, and then to a jack shaft, if that's what it's called. And then you see that stepped pulley there? That is how you would pick the speed of the machine. So a belt would run off of that pulley down to a machine on the ground. And you have four different options there for speeds. But also, if you see that bolt, there was a lever arm that was attached to that would, that would come down to ground level. And to turn the machine on, you slide that lever arm, it engages the clutch, and it actually gets this shaft spinning. You know, back in the, before the 20s, late 1800s, electric motors weren't quite as common and they were really expensive. 
So it made more sense to have a single electric motor in the shop and then just transfer power through this series of belts and pulleys to the different machines. Now sometime in the 20s and 30s, uh, machines, uh, electric motors started to become more common, more affordable, and uh, people would start to convert their line shaft machines to machines that had dedicated motors, thus beginning the process of rendering this type of system obsolete. Now, when we got in this building about two years ago, this still, run, this still works right now, actually. If I put power to that motor, it still turns on. And the machines were still running. They were using line shaft machinery in this machine shop up until about five years ago. So I've kept a lot of things. I kept a radial drill press. I kept a six foot Hendy lathe. I've kept a few other line shaft pieces of equipment. And uh, I plan on putting at least one or two of them back in service. So I'd like to keep this line shaft working. Had an issue though, the plumber came in when he did the trench with his mini excavator and actually hit my line shaft. You can see it's bent there. Yeah, I think he hit that pulley. There's like a notch in the pulley. And you know, this is where the office is gonna be. So I was hoping to have this piece of the line shaft protrude into the office, maybe run a big slow moving fan off of it or something, you know, something cool. But uh, you know, now I'm sort of forced into, uh, you know, that thing is so bent that there's no way I can turn it on now until I cut this bent section out. So um, the nearest coupler is right there. Unfortunately, I think my dreams of having the line shaft spinning in the office are, uh, well, almost over. So I think today's goal is to get rid of this bent and damaged section of the line shaft and then um, a few other places in the ceiling where they have jack shafts and various things still hanging that are really just in the way of me pressure washing and cleaning the ceiling. So uh, I have my oxyacetylene torch with me today. I got the bottles filled this morning at ARC 3. The plan is to cut out the damaged section and then sections that I know I won't um, bring back to life just based on where they are. And, um, all these line shafts uh, are supported, the bearing brackets are supported by these massive C-channel pieces. They're probably a quarter inch thick. A lot of steel, a lot of steel hanging above that isn't necessary. So we're gonna use forklift, man lift, oxyacetylene torch, and uh, some clever rigging and get rid of some of this metal. Uh, so I'm, I'm caught in between being as courteous as I can be to this old, let's face it, uh, almost non-existent technology, which again, I will keep in this building and keep running, just not to the extent that it was uh, when we got this shop. So I'm gonna make the functional section of the line shaft shorter and um, free up some ceiling space. So here we go. <laughs> screwed them to these six by sixes so that the shaft can sit here and you know not roll forward or backwards um, just a little something I feel better now and there we go one probably 10 foot section of line shaft removed safely from the ceiling now you can see how these work. These are big cast iron A-frames and the bearings are sort of self-adjusting. They move in, in both axes, X and Y, to uh, adjust to the shaft. And they're really rudimentary bearings, probably I would imagine uh, bronze or Babbitt bearings. Uh, I have to, they're not roller bearings. That technology wasn't really invented yet or it might have been, but it was not common. But uh, I mean, look at these pulleys. This is a giant wooden pulley. This is a cast iron pulley and a tiny little pulley here. And then another big wooden pulley. So 
if nothing else, this stuff is just cool art. You know, it could be part of an amazing light fixture, chandelier, uh, end table, that kind of thing. Or like I said earlier, it could be used again in a line shaft shop. So if you're looking for something like this, uh, drop me a line in the comments below and let's work out a deal. I'd love for it to go back in action before it becomes parts for another uh, project. So let me know. But uh, onward and upward, now uh, I'm gonna take down uh, this portion of C-channel that it was attached to and then wash, rinse, repeat around the shop. I got another small section here that I'd like to get rid of. And then, like I said, deal with the damaged section up front. So lots to do, but making swift progress. This rig worked out great. The shaft sat right in between the pieces of plywood and I wasn't worried about it uh, rolling around. So clever rigging, always helpful. channel is down feels uh feels pretty right cutting metal with an oxyacetylene torch in uh, a shop this old those that are pros with the oxyacetylene torch are probably laughing at my cuts but uh once you get the torch dialed in it makes pretty quick work it helps if you have a straight edge or a jig you can make your cut nicer but there's no real reason to make these cuts perfect just trying to get the metal out of the ceiling so that's a few hundred pounds of c channel now we're going to move on to this jack shaft uh, actually ran the radial drill press it sat right here and the belt is twisted because they wanted it to rotate in the opposite direction of the main shaft so one trick you could do is just flip the belt it barely contacts with itself in the center but you know, that level of abrasion isn't that big of a deal. And then it would spin this shaft in the opposite direction. And then same deal, it has a four stage cone pulley off the back that you would correspond with the cone pulley on the back of the machine. This little guy is probably gonna be used again for the drill press. I'll probably put it over there if possible, uh, especially because the cone pulley is matched. You need to keep those together. Uh, but once this little guy is down, it's attached to these giant pieces of C-channel that can also come down. So yes, wash, rinse, and somewhat repeat. productive day I've got a lot of C channel and a lot of useless to me line shaft pulley equipment uh, out of the ceiling I mean a lot of stuff a metric ton probably of C channel uh, a big jack shaft and then two smaller jack shafts this one was for the radial drill press so I'll probably take that cone pulley off and put it on the jack shaft that's still in the ceiling and this guy ran the uh, the brown and sharp horizontal milling machine up at the front of the building and I still have that machine as well so this cone pulley is relevant to that machine and all this stuff works because I've actually used it uh, when it was up and running so these two are still very functional probably not gonna get rid of those this big guy over here isn't really useful to me and um, honestly the C channel I'm probably gonna scrap because if I want to build an infrastructure similar to what was there in the future i can just use modern steel although you know many can argue that steel you get these days is not as good as steel you got back then anyway yeah the ceiling is 
becoming more clear. Uh, my little torch setup has been working great today. And um, yeah, having a scissor lift and forklift in here is paramount. Uh, it's nice problem to have these big tall ceilings. So yeah, one step closer, onward and upward. See you next time. Okay, back at it here at the machine shop. I need to get this building like absolutely completely empty. So I have borrowed a box truck from the good folks over there at Black Dog Salvage. And I will be loading absolutely everything that's left in here. Lights, wood, other various fixtures, workbenches, uh, and just bringing it to my garage at home. I've pretty much used up all the warehouse space at Black Dog and all the warehouse space down the street that Jerry's let me use. So this one's on me. I'm gonna put all this stuff in my house and also quite soon, um, hopefully, uh, once the ceiling is clean, we'll be pouring a new concrete slab in here. So that definitely means that everything needs to be clean, clear and out of the way. So onward and upward, gonna be load stuff into the truck. downtown Roanoke right now. The machine shop is pretty much in smack dab downtown Roanoke. And uh, I live in southeast on the other side of it. So um, yeah, it's about a 20, 25 minute drive to my house and uh, I'll be putting the last bit of things in my garage. And then we'll take this truck back to Black Dog and uh, load the, the multicolor pickup, uh, Wilson as we call it up with all the trash, take it to the dump, and hopefully the shop at that point will be nice and empty. Man, it's been two and a half years, but this building is almost empty. All right, I'm here at my house. I have a three bay detached garage and a single bay attached garage over here. I think what I'm gonna do is uh, I've got a Nissan 240 drift car. I'm gonna pull that out since it's not waterproof and put it in here and then take my Mercedes, put it over there and the Beamer in there and put it maybe back there. That way this entire shop can be filled with uh, the stuff in that truck. But yeah, here's the race car. It's a 93 Nissan 240 SX with an imported 1JZ GTE VVTi paired with a five-speed R154 transmission, slightly rebuilt internals, custom front end, full roll cage, race seats, fuel cell, custom dash. Anyway, as if I needed more projects, this is the, one, of my, one of my passion builds here. So uh, distraction over, I'm gonna move this thing into there, these two cars out, and then I'll have space in here to uh, fill with things. That thing's kind of obnoxious and fun. Uh, now I'm gonna move BMW out. Then we'll have all this space. This thing is dead. So now I got one German lady breathing life into the other German lady. So uh, seems to be a running theme on this channel. About four or five steps just to accomplish uh, the original step. So, 
Yeah, we'll let this battery charge up, get it out of here, then we'll put stuff in the garage. sign that this project is progressing in a quick pace because the custom car building side of me is being taken over by the uh, building overhaul side of me. Anyway, uh, yep, this is my home garage. It is now starting to be filled up with machine shop stuff, but that's okay because the building's almost empty and it'll be able to go right back in as soon as we pour the concrete slab. So. That's that for this video, I think. We're gonna get this truck back to Black Dog. So, yeehaw. Okay, so pressure washing. Really, I landed on pressure washing the ceiling because it was the most feasible solution that I could find. I investigated dustless blasting, which is basically sandblasting with water mixed in to keep the dust down. Um, I tried that right here on this section. It worked okay, but I tell you, for the cost and effort involved to run that machine and to be on a man lift in the ceiling with the hose and all the protective equipment, it just really didn't result in, um, well, the result that I was looking for. It was just splotchy and, and it was actually pretty aggressive to the wood. That led me back to pressure washing and I figured, okay, if I'm gonna pressure wash this, how can I make this as easy as possible? And then I had heard from somebody that they make telescoping wands for a pressure washer to do outsides of buildings and stuff like that. But I'm like, hey, I have a 15 foot ceiling. I wonder if I could get one of those to help me do that and it was the best thing I ever bought for my pressure washer. For, it's like the most useful tool I've bought this year. It worked so great. I was able to stay on the ground. I could lean the wand away from me so that the dirt, dirt and water that I was generating wouldn't drop in front of me instead of on me, which is a huge improvement uh, compared to standing on the man lift and using the normal pressure washer wand right above my face. Uh, it's just so much better. So. Because of that, because it was easier and I could move faster, I got the ceiling in here done in about five days. So I'm pretty pleased with that result. I also uh, did all the walls. There was, for whatever reason, in this one section, there was white paint, but I'm a pretty big fan of the result. I just pressure wash, you know, one course at a time, back and forth, and not spending too much time in one area, but I really like how this came out and being in the, um, architecture industry for a while. People spend hundreds of dollars trying to get this whitewashed finish and I got it with just careful application of a pressure washer. But the rest of the brick that's not painted came out great. It's got a lot of character. I mean, it's a hundred plus years old. So it cleaned up real nice with the exception of some real baked in stains and whatnot from the spinning line shaft throwing grease on the wall. Uh, and then the back wall is mostly concrete and it had this skim coat on it that is kind of flaking off. So I have to do something there. So the ceiling's pressure washed, the walls are pressure washed. It was time to finally hang the lights. And I didn't really film much of that process because I just got carried away trying to crank it out and get it done. And I just wasn't thinking about a camera, but they are up now. These are the salvage lights that I got from a commercial building in Maryland. Uh, the ballasts have been removed and they've been rewired to support LED bulbs. Uh, I think I had about 24 or 28 of them and I just hung them. I hung them, uh, just made up my own spacing system measuring off of these I-beams three feet and it seemed to space them nicely in between the sections. Uh, I may have gotten a bit carried away back here um, but the electrician's not here yet so I still have time to change things around. It's a bit tricky over here where the line shaft system is staying. I, I, just mock these sections up above the lion shaft. Hopefully that'll work. I think it'll still throw down enough light. And in fact, it may make the lion shaft system look pretty cool with light casting through it. So 
I still have a hole here that I need to fill with a few more sections. And then of course over here is the ceiling where the office is gonna be. The office is gonna go from that section there, kind of following this line and then that way. So this corner is gonna be the office. So I'll probably have different lighting for here. What do you think, Meg? What are you doing? Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's your two favorite dirty men coming back at you live. Uh, today, we have lots of action planned. We have some equipment. We got a Bobcat. We got a dump trailer. We got a jackhammer and concrete saw. And um, finally, I have concrete lined up. We are pouring a slab in this building next Wednesday. Nice. So five days from now. And the concrete guy was just uh, by this morning and I have a little bit of prep work to do for them. So this ramp, I don't know if you can see it on camera. This has got to get cut out, chipped out um, so that the concrete can be poured. All this will be replaced. So we're going to cut probably some relief cuts to, to control the chaos. And uh, we're going to pour everything new right up to the sidewalk. So today's plan is to do exactly what I just said. <laughs> uh, we're gonna move some of this extra gravel back in the corner back there and fill that hole with that. And then the loose concrete will load with the skid steer into the dump trailer and make it go away. So yeah, time to have fun. You ready? Ready. Making big rocks into little rocks, sir. It's I'm, funny when I pointed the camera at you. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. You want to give this a shot? What? At least you have your protective footwear on. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> that's so nice to see you out of the house. Quarantine. You're doing great. Thank you. Look at that. So many little rocks now. It's funny. I was uh, driving through the quarry a few weeks ago and it just dawned on me like people, there must be some people out there that are like, just no gravel as gravel. And it's yeah. like, you just get gravel from the gravel place. It's like, well, all gravel was big rocks at one point yeah. that they made into smaller rocks. Yeah. <laughs> with a very big machine. Yeah. With a big grinder and well, not, yeah, uh, the large version of this. Yeah. The application of force. <laughs> I guess I'll try to flip that one, huh?
Well, there we go. That was, I think it's the first thing in a long time that took as long as I thought it was gonna take. Oh. Much of the stuff of this project has taken way longer than I thought it was gonna it take. It took less time than I thought. Yeah. I thought that was gonna be a bear. But it worked. Well, we're bears. Well, not in the sense, I think bear is the term for like a big hairy gay man. That's right, not that. Yeah. Yeah. We're everything except the last part. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's fine. <laughs> to quote Seinfeld, but <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> not my preference. But uh, we're good. So we got, um, this will, we'll neaten this up a little bit, level it out as much as we can, probably blend some of the good gravel into the, the pits. And then uh, there was some patch here that we had to cut up, get rid of. And yeah, I think everything else that's left is gonna be a nice, flat, predictable surface for the new slab to lay on. And now we just gotta get rid of this concrete waste. And we're out here at a local uh, demolition company's dumping yard to dump this fine load of fine aged concrete and uh i admit i think we loaded this up a bit more than i thought we were going to yeah. so i'm hoping the hydraulics in this dump trailer will do it i'm hoping your truck doesn't blow your transmission <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's a good sign Couldn't have done it without this man right here. Look at this atlas of a man. <laughs> well, anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you guys for watching as always. And uh, we are one step closer to building cool stuff in this building. Oh, can't wait. Can't wait. Me either. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the machine shop. I am sitting in my truck. Uh, it is uh, Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. I'm in rainy rush hour traffic. Rush hour as it can be at the tail end of the pandemic. But I am driving to the shop because today is a big day. Today is the day we pour concrete. Specifically, we're pouring 50 cubic yards of fiber impregnated concrete over the 3,700 square foot building. That is the former Price Filler Machine Shop and uh, the new downtown headquarters for my company, Lift Art Studios. Okay, we're here at the building getting ready. Um, we got guide pens, tap cons, Bridges back there doing a great job. Say hi, Bridges. <laughs> Um, we've ground down this section that was a little greasy and leaky, so the concrete's gonna be able to bond. And uh, got the whole ramp area leveled out. And so the neighbors are cooperating. We got room that way, we got room that way. We're gonna have a giant pump truck set up right here, pumping into the building. And then the ready mix concrete truck will be able to back up to the pump truck dumping the pump truck and all that so you'll see it when it starts happening but we're about 20 minutes away yeehaw Ben Comer and his son Bridges. Uh, what's the name of your company? Comer Construction. Comer Construction, they're kind of handling. They've done all the prep work on the concrete slab and we're uh, supervising today, right? Yep. What do y'all, what are we worried about? What do you think? Making sure there's strand, fiber strand in the concrete. Yeah, so the first concrete truck actually showed up without any fiber in it. So he had to throw it in the top and now he's mixing it up. But we got a bunch of guys standing around ready to work. So let's hope for a smooth, Productive day, <laughs> yeah. right?
What's the biggest slab you've done? This one. This one? Yeah. That's not what I want to hear. No. Nope. <laughs> what matters is how. Okay, so it's Friday. Uh, we poured the slab on Wednesday, and it's had two days to dry now. And I think this is the first day I'm gonna see it and be able to walk on it and check it out. I'm so excited. Let's see the result. And I've already put the dogs in here. Hi, Stella. Say hi to everybody. There's May over there. Wow, look at this slab. Look at this slab. So they saw cut the relief joints. Um, man, this is a completely different space. Look at this. 3,700 square foot building. This was about 45 cubic yards of concrete. It's a four inch thick slab and pumped in within a day. And it is fiberated. It's got fiberglass fibers in it to help increase the strength and then just polished with a rotary trowel. And it is awesome. It is so flat. For those of you that know what this floor used to look like, this is incredible. Um, it dried really slow. We've been getting a lot of rain here lately. And um, while I was able to 
put tarps over the skylights to keep them from leaking. It did leak in a few other places, but it's just been cold and really humid. And uh, one thing I learned about pouring concrete on top of existing concrete is that concrete dries by the water inside of it evaporating. And normally on a new slab, it's just being poured on gravel. So the water is able to go down through the gravel, thus allowing the concrete to cure pretty quickly. Here, the water had nowhere to go except up. So all the water in the concrete had to rise to the surface and then evaporate that way, which took much longer. The poor concrete guys were here. We started the pour at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. They were here until probably 5 a.m. on Thursday. So it was a long day for them because concrete's all about timing. They had to wait for it to harden to a certain point to where they can run that rotary trowel on it and really get it flat like this. And if you do it too early, it doesn't really polish up. If you do it too late, you're screwed. So you really have to wait and babysit it and wait till it's the perfect time for that. So good on them. Nathan and his, his dad, Tim, uh, at RHR uh, did an amazing job. Ben Comer with Comer Construction orchestrated the whole thing and did all the prep work, including the pins and the tap cons and everything. Welcome back to the machine shop. Uh, I am here standing on a brand new concrete slab that I have just finished sealing. And it has been hardened for about 12 days now. And I've been told by experts that I can start putting weight on it. You probably have already guessed that being that there's a forklift and stuff behind me. But yeah, 3,700 square feet of brand new concrete. Nice. It's fibrated, which means it has like glass fibers in it to help uh, increase the tensile strength. And it is a, I think a 4,000 PSI mix. And I didn't do the cleanest job spraying sealer on there. I kind of tried to do it like a car paint job, but the sprayer I was using wasn't the most even thing in the world. But I should achieve what I was going after, which is to make the, the slab waterproof, stain resistant. Um, and it makes the texture a little, little, um, smoother so it's nice anyway the time has come to move everything back in and now for something completely unrelated I am at black dog salvages warehouse here on Ashlawn Street right by the Roanoke River and the Roanoke Greenway uh, Black Dog Salvage is the architectural salvage company that my dad started. Uh, many of you watching probably know that. I've worked here for 15, 16 years and um, have just, you know, peeled off to do this machine shop thing. But anyway, this place, um, what we do is salvage old buildings that are slated for demolition or heavily heavy remodel and save the architectural elements uh, that make them up to reuse or resale. So today I'm looking for a few things for the new office, the new space. I'm looking for some big windows that I can put in between the office and the workshop. I'd like to be able to, you know, be in the office and be able to look out and see everything. And uh, I'm also looking for some pallet racking and maybe some of this corrugated metal for siding on the outside of the office. Just doing a little bit of shopping for, uh, for the new space. So let's see what we can find today. So it looks like here's a stash of metal frame windows. Uh, they're a little rough. Looks like if I use these, we're gonna have to replace most of the glass, which isn't that big of a deal, but it's, uh, Good little chunk of work but i do need to go ahead and get something today because i believe we're going to start framing in the office tomorrow and so the framers need to know how big the openings will be in the wall of the office so um 
definitely going to try to utilize some of this and i i really do want to use salvage because you know it's in my blood i think it's pretty cool being that the building itself is historic and i'm in a way salvaging it it would be cool to use salvage materials so i'm going to root through some of this get some measurements see how many are complete and uh then maybe go look at some other stuff So found a few things inside, found uh, some large single light, you know, single pane of glass doors. I'm pretty much gonna commit to the three foot by seven foot size. So it doesn't matter what door I find, the framers know which op what opening to build. So actually the more important goal is to find the windows because the windows do not have to be a standard size and it's sort of up to me to figure out what I wanna put in there and they're gonna be framing tomorrow. So, sorta of need to commit to something. Here's one of the windows that are in nicer shape over here. Uh, this thing's gorgeous. I'm gonna measure it real quick. But it's got all the glass in it. It's just a great start. I gotta do minimal work to it. Just repaint it. So there's one here. And there's a few more out here in the iron yard that I'm gonna look at as well these guys ah much bigger pieces of glass and they don't open i kind of like that very simple better condition less rust less damage i'm going to measure these and measure that one okay so framing update i'm standing in the front corner of the building where the office is going to be and uh yesterday uh me and Greg Rhodes, the contractor on the project, laid out the walls for the office and bathroom that we're gonna frame in here. And we got everything mapped out on the ground. Two by six exterior walls, two by four interior walls, and made a call to Ideal Building Supply here in Roanoke and got some wood delivered this morning. So we got pressure treated boards for everywhere the wall touches the floor or the mason, mason walls, the brick walls and then regular wood for everything else. So yeah, um, now we just wait for contractor to reach back out to the framer, get his guys uh, moving, and then come over here probably early tomorrow morning and start framing out the office. It's a new day new day here at the shop here is an update so far so the plumber came in yesterday and ran all the plumbing for the various fixtures so now it's a little bit more apparent what's going to be done in here uh, outside here this is the door into the bathroom and into the office you're looking at it from the fab shop side there'll be a utility sink here with a hose bib so that's what this is for in here will be the actual bathroom sink. Uh, this fancy hanger, um, two bars come out from it and support the heck out of the new sink so it'll be nice and strong, not going anywhere. The toilet will be here. And now the framer came in and finished his half wall. So uh, you can see where the walk-in shower is gonna be. Walk in here, there's the drain. There's the mixing valve. And because I'm super tall, got the the output to be 
mounted real tall. I think that's probably seven feet in the air. So yeah. Now, I mean, if you're making it from scratch, you might as well make it for, make it to fit, make it comfortable. Uh, and that's where the water comes in. So it goes up there. And then we also got lines going up through the floor or ceiling uh, to go to the water heater that's gonna be up there. It's gonna be up in this area as well as HVAC. So that's where we're at is framing. Uh, all I'm really waiting on is electrical now. So I got a few electricians hopefully showing up at some point soon to do the rough in electrics for the office. All right, guys, so here's the deal. I'm here on my front porch. Walker, my editor, gave me a call and was like, hey man, we need something to wrap up the videos. Can you film some stuff? And I look all up, my house has terrible lighting. I don't, have, I don't have time to set up a studio or anything like that. So I come on the front porch and my neighbor chooses that exact moment to start mowing his yard. So you know what? This is what you get. Thanks for watching. I'm drinking a beer. Okay, well, exciting day here at the shop. Things are starting to come back over. Second trailer load of things coming in. Hey guys, yeah man, we're bringing parts back. It's a good day. It's Gosh. Boomerang day. I have forgotten even what I put in these crates. But this one's obvious. This is a 1950s Hendy lathe, so that's coming back in. These file cabinets I think are full of tools and then some other stuff. So working on racking, but in the meantime, they need space back over at the warehouse and going to bring it in the shop. Oh boy, flashback Friday. It is all coming back to me. Thank God I palletized all this stuff because now it is not nearly as cumbersome to move around as it was back then. But I mean, it's just a million things. Chuck lades, old power tools, and arbor press, lathe stuff. Large metal, precision metal, drill bits, reamers. Stuff, more stuff, things I found in the mezzanine. What is in here? Ah, yes, all the crazy paperwork. How to run a lathe, that's important. Anyway, uh, if I'm not careful, I'm gonna have a pile of stuff and know where to put it. So, um, it is time to focus on pallet racking. I got a few leads in town, gonna follow up, follow up on them um, ASAP. So try to take advantage of some of this vertical space and be able to uh, have somewhere to put all this stuff as I take it out of these totes. Okay, so uh, I am back from the Black Dog Salvage Warehouse over there on Ashlawn. Um, there was that pile of pallet racking there. I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to put together some matching sets, but after some digging, here's what I came up with. So I got three uh, eight foot uprights and two 12 foot uprights. Um, plan is to put the two eight foot sections under these windows, uh, which is perfect because if I put the 12 foot sections there, it would cover up the windows and then start working the 12 foot section down this wall. And um, that's pretty much as far as I've gotten with the plan. Let me get these unloaded, throw some together and see where we end up. Okay, not bad. Um, bunch of ways you can put these together, different heights for each shelf. I think for the eight foot units, two shelves is enough. Um, I sort of just shot from the hip. I made the bottom shelf a, a good height to be like a work table, workbench, but not being too high. Me being six, seven, I kind of want to make every work table, you know, 40 inches, but 
it's nice to pick a happy medium between tall, what p tall people need and the rest of the world. And then I just sort of picked a nice round three feet to put in between the next one so that the the shelf and what the top shelf and whatever's on it doesn't completely block the windows. I'm not completely sold on it being here. And one thing I realized is that I'd like to paint this back wall um, and repair some sections before I put racking and stuff in front of it. But this stuff's so light, it's easy to move at this point. I just kind of wanted to get something together before the end of the week so that I got a little sense of accomplishment. Good, he says. Good. Because I'm good. Fun story. I've been in search for pallet racking for a, about a month now. And I had about three no goes in town. Either people wanted way too much for it or it fell through or something. And then Wyatt turned me on to a company in Richmond called Wise Manufacturing. Uh, they sell used pallet racking, so they quoted me for used. And then I told him I wanted it and so he was going to Richmond anyway he got there they didn't have any used stuff but they're so nice that they gave me new stuff for the price of used how about that I got my shirt on you do you missed a button I missed the button <laughs> are you gonna film this you sure you want to mm -hmm. film this oh yeah. oh yeah he's gonna be editing it now too so <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I want to see yeah, that's right it's what everybody wants to see uh -huh. really you can uh, put that a screenshot on your computer. <laughs> yeah. That'll be the thumbnail, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> you see the last thumbnail? Yeah. So this stuff is going to go in here. Right along this wall, for the most part. Cue the montage. <laughs> A heavy day yeah. but we reorganized everything that's in the shop already all the stuff i got from greg's shop here in town that i bought that wood shop uh the pallet racking that wyatt brought in is all set up over there and it is more than serving its purpose right now and one thing i realized is that i'd like to paint this back wall um and repair some sections before I put racking and stuff in front of it. So this back wall, this back concrete wall, is um, old, to say the least. This building's 100 years old, if not a little bit more. And so concrete over time starts to degrade a bit, and the, the cement breaks down, um, leaving the aggregate to, to take on a sort of sand-like uh, texture and property. I don't like sand. It's coarse, and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. So I have been sort of brainstorming on what to do. I, I wanna just paint this back section of the wall, you know, from here down. Just something, probably just paint it white for now uh, with a nice primer and then I can come back and I wanna do a mural or a big logo wall or something cool later. But I know I wanna start with a nice white, thick, heavy duty primer. But before that, I need to stabilize this concrete. So uh, I met with my friend Richard Taylor this morning. Richard owns Designed Concrete Surfaces and he does custom concrete countertops floor resurfacing, uh, really cool stuff. He, he does, uh, he'll take recycled glass and mix it in with the concrete to where you get this really cool pebbled effect on your countertop or your bar. Uh, anyway, he's a concrete whisperer. And uh, this morning I met him at his shop after having a phone call with him yesterday regarding my problem. And he hooked me up with some of this stuff. This is profile corrector and a 
universal activator, surface primer and powder activator. So what we do is we spray this stuff on the, um, the areas where the concrete's a bit degrading and it, by, in, in this case, a surface primer is going to stabilize the concrete and lock the loose pieces in place. So we'll spray that on with the sprayer that I got for sealing the floor. And then we will mix that with some water and half of this bag and we'll trowel that into the big divots, the big cracks, bring it back to flat, and then we can come over the whole thing with kills, primer, happy days, and we can come over that with whatever I want. So I'm gonna try out some of this stuff. Okay, so I have primed the areas that I would like to patch and cover. This primer is supposed to bond, lock, seal, um, and prep for the cover and fill. So I was told not to let it dry too much. Definitely within the first few hours is when I want to start filling the holes. So I'm um, gonna mix some stuff up here soon and patch it away. All right, mixed it up <clears throat> and uh, I'll spread it on. As I sit here on my front porch, drinking a beer, listening to my neighbor mow his lawn, uh, I feel like it's a great time to wrap up the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like what you see, hit the like button, uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more, that way you don't miss it. Everything you do to reach out to us is greatly appreciated. I try to respond to everybody's comments. Thank you, thank you. Uh, follow Lift Arc Studios on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, sometimes I get carried away and post stories and cool things about what's going on and uh, it's just a good way to engage with us. So uh, I'm gonna go inside. It sounds like my neighbor is gonna keep mowing his yard. Thanks again for watching. All right, good morning. I'm here out behind Black Dog and it is time to refurbish these metal frame windows. So Got one here on um, sawhorses, ready to be worked on. This one is in the worst shape of the two. Uh, this one's in a little bit better shape. It's got all its glass and it's not quite as corroded, but they're both in pretty nice shape. So put this one on the operating table first. And the goal is to extract the glass, which we can then strip all this paint off for whatever reason they painted over it. Uh, and to do that, you got to pick away at this glazing. Luckily, it's pretty dried out, so it shouldn't put up much of a fight. Uh, at which point, we can straighten the metal frame. It's a little bent. Um, clean the glass. Re uh, well, at that point, clean and paint the frame. Uh, get this pivoting window working again. And then we can... Um, reinstall the glass and reglaze. So yeah, you get after it. So, in the course of about an hour and a half, um, made pretty quick work of the glass and glazing in this frame. And I'll tell you, this thing is the secret. This is an oscillating tool. 
the blade broke off on the very last window but before it broke it was awesome in uh, vibrating and cutting into the glazing but it's precise enough to where I can control it and not break the glass mostly um, here's all the glass I was able to save a good 15 seconds I think I only broke two or three and then I followed it up with a wire wheel to clean inside the frame and now the next step is to take this vertical piece off uh, this is how you would join two windows together in the industrial setting and I'm going to do the same thing there is part of the other window still bolted to this so I got to unbolt that and then unbolt it from this window uh, a little trick uh, when we're dealing with these square headed nuts the trick to get those off being that you can't put a six point socket over them uh, I use a 12 point socket because six cannot be divided by four but 12 can and so take find a corresponding 12 point socket put it on an impact driver stick it on there and the thing comes right off so nice top tip there so i'm going to blow this trim piece off and then get this middle window operable again and then it's just a matter of sanding and painting reinstall the glass repaint the other one and then we'll be able to install these in the office wall so making good progress So I didn't have the camera rolling, but I wanted to share this satisfying moment with you guys. I soaked this operable window in like a penetrant spray to break down rust and it started to move. Look how cool it is. It's awesome. It doesn't hinge like I thought. See these windows hinge in the middle and swing out. How good is that? Hinges sort of from the top and in the middle with these cool Z hinges. Oh, this is gonna be so nice. Real pumped about this. I wonder if this one's the same. I don't think this one's the same, but that's okay. That's what you get when you use old stuff. All right, so now the plan is to straighten out this stuff. It is quite bent. Um, should be able to rent the wrangle back into place, no problem. But I'm gonna use an oxyacetylene torch. Uh, that way I can heat the metal up, put this crescent wrench over it, sort of like this. You know, and then I can be able to bend it back and forth. Also have my trusty hammer with me. So, let's give that a shot. So, the frame is clean. I've wire brushed everything and uh, I've rubbed it down with a little bit of denatured alcohol. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna try to prime it with some of this stuff. Galvanizing primer covers and primes rust, builds a tight bond with a substrate and galvanizes metal surfaces. So, give this guy a nice coat of paint and uh, primer, I mean, and then we'll come back with probably a coat of black to uh, make it look good. Seems to be going well. Got the whole thing primed up, looking pretty good. Uh, this thing, the way it hinges out, it's doing what it's doing right now because it's broken. Uh, it's supposed to stay sliding in these tracks. Actually, it would look like that, but it's not supposed to do that. Uh, some pieces here that are just too far gone. So, good news is uh, it won't be open very often and when we do we can just crack it and it should stay in place because it's pretty tight 
So I'm not gonna worry about that. Uh, I'd spend way too much time right now just trying to fix a hinge when I can just get these painted, installed. And if I wanna tackle it later for whatever reason, I can. So this guy's primed up, looking good. Uh, we're gonna paint it black. I got some uh, Rust-Oleum Professional semi-gloss black that we're gonna hit it with. We'll hit this side, we'll flip it, hit the other side. Then that means this one will be ready for glass and glazing. Uh, this guy, I'm gonna try to paint, prime and paint without taking the glass out. And hopefully I'll just be able to scrape the overspray off the glass with a razor blade. So making decent progress. It's hot today, middle of June. So uh, we'll take a break and get back at it in a second. window is completely painted um, still here at black dog day two um, it is all black now just gonna wait for it to dry might do a second coat of black and then it will be time to clean the glass reinstall the glass reglaze the glass and uh, yeah so as soon as this guy's dry I'm gonna move it out of the way and start working on that piece over there okay so I'm here in the uh, lamp slash window shop here at Black Dog. Uh, they restore all kinds of window sashes and um, things like that here. Uh, and there's some tricks to it. This old stuff definitely takes a little bit more uh, TLC. So I've got these panes here and for whatever reason in the past they painted over the panes. I guess to black out the, uh, the wall and keep light or maybe make it more private. But obviously I want these to be clear again. So um, while I could probably just take a razor blade and go to town, I'm going to try adding a little bit of denatured alcohol, which obviously it says it cleans glass, but the um, main reason to do that is to keep the razor sliding instead of scratching at the glass. It actually looks like it's working pretty good. Not exactly a stripper. This should glide along the surface of the glass pretty easily. Side done. the next window got it up here on the saw horses and uh, not in bad shape actually this is the front or the outside as it were uh, it's got the same problem as the other one did where the sliders are compromised so the window just comes out completely but I'm not gonna worry about it too much at least they're both the same <clears throat> and I'll find a solution later I'm gonna try to keep the glass in this one so I'm gonna take uh, a wire wheel and just clean up the metal frame <clears throat> try not to hit the glass with the wire wheel just stay in the frame and I'll flip it do the other side prime and paint this one and then again the overspray I will just uh, clean off the glass 
when I'm done. shop and paint is dry and I've cleaned all the glass that I pulled out successfully so now we're gonna put all the glass in that I saved we're gonna figure out how many pieces I need to cut to replace the ones that were broken or just not there and then we'll put these little fancy clips in hold the glass and then we'll start glazing Let's see if I remember how to glaze windows the camera was rolling the whole time I was doing this glazing but it wasn't so sorry you got to miss one of the most uh, dirty parts of this job but you get to see the aftermath so here it is freshly glazed window the process is very not elegant you literally just roll window glazing and cram it into the edge and then come back with a glazing knife and just shave off the excess and then you know you got to come back and fix little pieces here and there but you can kind of just smudge it with your hand but this is uh this is how they've done it for hundreds of years and this window is probably a hundred years old so <sighs> pretty satisfying i can see the light at the end of the tunnel for these windows and um i think it'll all be worth it so obviously this window glazing is white and the other one I've painted black already. So I have to come back and paint the glazing black. Um, but that'll just be the icing on the cake to make it all blend in. And obviously I want the windows to match, but it's been a long day. I'm tired. It's getting close to the weekend. I'm signing off. I will see you guys next time. Peace. Today, we got a familiar face in the building. Mr. Hi. Wyatt Allen, repping Jake's Heating and Cooling, who will also be here later. Jake's a good guy. He's gonna put that unit in there. But today's goal is to frame in that giant hole for those windows over there. And we got a plan. We got a plan. This is our opening we need. 102 and change and 110 and a half and change. We got these three pressure treated two by sixes and we're gonna cut them, screw them in, shrink the opening, and then we can mount these big old double windows. So let's get to it. Why well, was plan? Plan. So we have got between a half and three quarter inch extra space that we need to make up. So we're gonna use quarter inch spacers on each side. Makes so, a half an inch. There you go. These are 110 and five eighths. They are gonna be the. They're, we're trying to take up the horizontal space right now. So we're gonna lay these in. Screw this to that on both sides. And then we'll have our horizontals and then we just lower the top level and we're good. Time to screw it in. So 
So we got our opening set up. Uh, theoretically, it should be just a little bit bigger than the two windows put together. And so the flange of the windows will mount on this surface and we'll lag bolt it in. We can, the good part is it's in two halves. So we can put up one window, the dividing strip, and then the second window instead of having to erect it <laughs> all in one, uh, all in one go. So we got to go to the hardware store, get some lag bolts to drill them into the wood and some threaded bolts to drill them, to attach them together and a caulking gun and, caulking and gun. lunch. All right, so here we are back from the hardware store. <laughs> we got a caulk gun for this silicone and we got some bolts and nuts. So these will hold the window frame into the wood and then we'll use these to bolt the windows together. So let's do that. Let's do that. We got windows. We got windows. That's big a window. big boy. So things that went well. Our math this morning was pretty close. Pretty close. My math before measuring them was helpful. Uh, my math counting the hardware and tractor supply was not accurate. Either that or my math with the initial numbers of getting the hardware. Yeah, wasn't you were doing all kinds of weird math. Your, I'm blaming it on you. Well, I'm blaming it on you because I, under <laughs> I didn't understand. I was starting to count very slowly and calmly and you were like, well, let's take this, divide it by two and multiply. And I'm like, yeah, because things need to be more complicated than they should be. Welcome to you the know, world of wide out. This is how I, <laughs> my MO. Hey, we're supposed to be trying to get away from our father's mistakes. I'm, I'm struggling in I a very sure. similar way. I did not fall too far from that tree. Enough of that though. These windows are awesome. <laughs> So yeah, they're big boys. They're all bolted in. We caulked it. We drove it in with lag bolts. This strip that joins the two windows together fit great. And we use some of the old hardware for right now. I'm gonna get some modern hardware at some point. But this was a big, big deal. And because we have now gotten the inspect, we passed our framing inspection, rough in and everything else, we're very close to being able to put drywall on these walls. So this was a perfect time to do this. So yeah, anyway, it's been a good day. Hi everybody, welcome back to the machine shop. Uh, today is an exciting day, a little bit off program, but not so much. Um, recently I was able to acquire a good chunk of woodworking equipment from a local craftsman who has had a change of heart. He's moving out of town. He did great work, but it's just time for him to move out of the business in his mind. And um, I was able to buy a lot of his equipment before he packed it up and moved it out uh, and put it in a storage unit. So I went down to Black Dog. I borrowed the giant box truck. And yesterday in a uh, hurried adventure because of the rain, uh, me, my buddy Steve Heinzel, also a talented fabricator, and Greg, uh, the guy I bought the stuff from, all loaded this truck and his truck with his entire shop. And uh, today we are unloading it here at the machine shop. And I got some really cool stuff. Can't wait to show you guys what's in the truck. Some staples. You know, I got a table saw, Powermatic 66 table saw, dust collector, uh, assortment of power tools, um, I can't even remember what else I got. It's, it's, it was a late night yesterday. So today we're gonna unpack the truck, load it in here, and in the process we're gonna get to go over what I got and uh, where to put it. Start laying out tools in the shop. So let's get into it. So I've just started opening the truck. Let's climb in here, see what we got. So first of all, got all kinds of sheet stock, cabinet grade, paint grade, MDF, 
some birch plywood, some veneer stuff, really nice things. Powermatic dust collector, air hose reels, really helpful. Uh, there's the table saw and back there is the outfeed table for the table saw that Greg built himself. I also got this nice clamp rack and a bunch of Bessie bar clamps. Uh, some Makita power tools, pass load framers, framing nailers. These cool tables, um, two looks like four by eight wooden work tables. This one is perforated uh, with specifically sized holes that can accept certain modular clamp and fixture jigs. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, and then just a bunch of other random bits and bobs that Greg didn't need and he didn't want to have to put into a storage unit. So I, I accepted them. So uh, today's mission, unload this into the building, take this truck back, and then uh, actually got to go back over there with Steve later and get some more stuff. But uh, let's get moving. All right, so real quick, what I think I'm gonna do, all that plywood I have in the truck, I'm gonna get some of it and cut some shelves for this rack here so that I have a place to put, uh, to put some tools and equipment and stuff. It's like a ballet. <laughs> Everybody say hi to Steve. Hey. Hi Steve. Steve and I have worked together for a long time. We have some grand ideas for this space in the future, but he's here to help me move this stuff in. But speaking of stuff, this is some of the things I snagged from Greg's shop. Look at these Bessie I-beams. You can never have too many clamps, right? Love me some clamps. All right, onto the table saw and tables. Okay, so me and the hat are back here on Roar Avenue. It's Friday and it's time for another big move. I think the last video we titled Big Move was moving the stuff out of the shop and that was like a year and a half ago, uh, which has been, I didn't want it to be that long ago. I think I told Connor and Jerry that I was only gonna need their building for about three months. so. I'm doing something real special for them here soon, getting them a nice gift to uh, partially repay my inconvenience. But let's go and walk into the building now, about five, six doors down from my building. And we're gonna see what's left, what we're gonna try to move today, or at least partially. And this is all my stuff on the right. So let's go over what we got and what we're gonna move. I don't have any help today, so I'm really just gonna be able to move anything that's on a pallet or can be carried by the forklift. But we have a 12 foot Lodge and Shipley metal lathe. We have a six foot Hendy line drive lathe. We have this big Delta drill press with gear reduction motor. 
old air compressor. I'm not sure if it still works or not, but we saved it. This cool Johnson horizontal bandsaw, which actually works really well still. Of course, we got a bridge port. That thing is gonna be real nice to have. Works great, lots of tooling for it. We have a brown and sharp horizontal milling machine with a dividing head, which is that guy right there. We have this surface grinder, which is kind of cool. I'm sure we'll find a use for that. Various metal stock, beams, shafts, uh, tables, worktops. Back there, you got more tables. We got a giant late 1800s radial drill press, a LeBlond horizontal milling machine that needs a little bit of work, a vertical bandsaw press, Craftsman drill press, a Sebastian lathe, a turret lathe, and then, ooh, a wood stove. Forgot about that. And then all this carding, tooling, this weird desk. Um, so yeah, that is what I'm going to try to start moving today. Again, I'm only going to be able to start on the stuff that's, uh, that's palletized, but let's get into it. Hey guys, just want to say thank you so much for watching. Um, if you like what you see, like, subscribe. Hopefully I'm near the end of doing these renovation videos and we can actually start building things uh, in real time because you're seeing these videos a little after everything happened. I'm a week or two away from actually working out of this space. So I'm very excited to start showing you guys the fabrication side of my brain, what we're going to be able to do here. And spoiler alert, we got a CNC plasma cutter, hopefully coming our way in a few weeks. So stay tuned. See you on the next one. Consume my content. <laughs> like the cookie monster. Yeah. I imagine you're rolling. <laughs> yes, <I am. sighs> hey guys, Tay here, of course, down here at Lift Arc Studios, the old price filler machine shop, my new life. <laughs> so uh, in the last video, you saw me, Tay Whiteside, move stuff back in. And it has been quite a while uh, since that video. Walker will flash it up right here, the date in which that video was published. Let's all sigh. But we're back and um, honestly, we are open for business. I have already been working in this shop now. I've done a few builds for some clients and I have more lined up. So I'm trying to hit the ground running. Uh, Walker, uh, thankfully, has also been super busy with paying jobs and so he and I have been, um, what little free time we've had available, we've been trying to film and organize and put these videos together for you. Um, and so what we're gonna do is do uh, what Walker has deemed a super cut, where the next two videos 
we'll have basically all the steps from where we left off to now. Uh, just hit one after the other and we'll take you all the way through. So in this video, we're doing uh, lights. We're installing the new light fixtures, uh, the shrouds and the bulbs. We're building a custom shower. I say we as if I had any help. I'm building a custom shower. Uh, then a crew came in and did the insulation. Another crew came in and did the drywall and uh, the plywood on the outside of the office. And then I paint the office. You probably see some of this blue color. And then the bathroom gets painted this cool uh, copper orange color. And um, then we'll jump into part two in a different video. But thank you guys for supporting the channel and me and the business and everybody involved. Um, you know, YouTube, uh, you know, our channel's not big enough really to support monetarily, but one day. But anyway, thank you for watching. Enjoy this video and the next video. And then very soon I've been filming builds that I've been doing. So we'll jump right into doing build videos and how to. So thank you guys. See you next time. So basically with the lights and the ceiling, all the, the wire has been run to them. Um, everything from the panel to the light is connected and complete. All I need to do is wire up these wires that are coming into the lights to the actual sockets in the lights and then put the covers on them and put the bulbs in. And once we have our um, electrical inspection, we can flip the breaker on and uh, light this place up. So that is very exciting. I'm gonna work on that basically until the building inspector gets here. So he's gonna be here at some point today, but he didn't tell me when. So we're just hanging out and uh, waiting for him to show up and then hopefully we pass, but that's what I'm gonna do in the meantime. Okay, so uh, I've made some good progress on the lights. I have 10 lights still to go, but I've wired and assembled 18 or 14. I can't remember how many lights I had. Here's what they look like when they're done. Uh, I got these reflector shields on them and the wires that Chris, the electrician, ran into the casing is now wired up to the sockets for the bulbs which leads me to the next step is bulbs uh, and i'm going to do that before i finish the lights because i need to order some parts so each light requires two of these uh shields these guys and uh, somehow when i was salvaging these from that commercial building in maryland i must have left some there so i need to find uh 10 more 11 more of these reflector shields and then I need to order 20 of the little metal clips that clip them to the housing so there might still be some in my garage that I forgot but I'm afraid I'm gonna have to try to find some but anyway I'll cross that bridge when I get there being that I'm at a stopping point with that I'm gonna go ahead and spend the rest of the day inserting these light bulbs into the lights so as a refresher what we did was remove the ballasts because these used to be fluorescent fixtures and i got some led bulbs that fit the sockets but they run off of line voltage they run off the raw 120 volts that are coming into the light and so you can just remove the ballast and wire the incoming power directly to the sockets snap in these light bulbs i went with these i found on amazon they're called parmita T8 four foot LED tubes, and they are going to be 5000K, which is more of a daylight white light instead of the traditional yellow light. So it should be camera friendly in here and look nice and modern and clean and bright. So I have five boxes of these, there's 20 in a box. So let's see how many I can burn through coming up now.
today I am going to begin the endeavor that is building out my custom shower. Uh, before we get to that, I want to point out a few things that we've gotten done. You may notice the uh, insulation that's up. Shout out to Kent's Insulation here in town. They came in and did this in about an hour. <clears throat> and we've also started the HVAC endeavor. My buddy Jake, uh, with Jake's Heating and Cooling here in town, has started fitting up a two and a half ton air handler into this space above the bathroom. And we've also put the rooftop unit on the roof and started to uh, drill holes through the roof to connect all those and power everything. Um, and the windows are in. Um, glazing's almost dry after about a month and a half and I'll be able to paint the glazing black on that one. And we've gotten the bathroom to a certain spot. So I've shown you guys this before, sink, toilet, shower. And my plan with the shower is to do it all myself. And I've been taking myself to YouTube shower school for a while. And as I, was under, I understand it, there's a few different ways to do it. I've done a shower in my master bathroom and I use the Weedy system, which is a system where you get a pre-sloped shower pan and then the, uh, the waterproof wall panels and you just put the pan down, you put the curb in, you put the wall panels up, you seal everything and it's done. Uh, it's great, it works super nice, but it's really expensive. Um, and for this shower, the quote I got for just the materials on the Weedy system was $1,600. So uh, what I'm gonna do is a hybrid of a few different techniques. I am going to build my curb Actually, I have a Schluter curb that I got from a friend of mine that he wasn't using. I'm going to figure out my curb, and then I'm going to pour my own shower pan and slope it myself. So you use what's called like bed mud or deck, deck mud. And once you have the pan framed out, the area, you, you kind of put blocking in the walls here, kind of like this, but all the way around. And you got to get your curb put in. And once you have like a recessed area where the pan's gonna go, you basically just dump your, you put some thin set on the ground and you dump your deck mud, deck mud in and you slope it a quarter inch per, per foot from the outside to the drain. And that, when I do it, I'll go over, kind of take you with me on that. There's a, quite a few steps to doing that right, but it doesn't look like it's gonna be that hard. So we'll figure that out when we get there. And then once you've sloped your pan and the deck mud sets up, then you put thin set on, the waterproof membrane on, um, put your wall boards up. And I think actually the wall boards, the waterproof stone boards on the walls go in first. And then you do your decking. I'll have to figure out what the right order of operations is there. And then you just use uh, the weedy membrane to cover your joints, corners, and all your edges. Um, and then you come over it with uh, Ardex 8 plus 9, I believe, which is a waterproofing solution that you will, I will coat the entire shower in once it's done, which makes it 100% waterproof, and then I can tile on top of that. So, I know that was a lot of information. The only reason it's so fresh in my mind is because I spent all morning researching what to do, uh, and I'm fairly positive I know what I need to go get from Home Depot. So. That's why you measure, folks. Got that hole bang on, got that hole bang on. Feels good.
with Alex and Herman. Alex J Construction. Big shout out. They framed the office. And today we're doing OSB and drywall. Well, just OSB today? Yeah. Well, sorry. Maybe both. Maybe both. Is it just you two today? Yeah. All right, well, I'll help as much as I can. But uh, first board going up. Cue the montage. All right, well, Alex and Herman got a good start on the OSB on the outside of the office today. And I'm gonna turn this fan off so you can hear me. So they got this wall done. And they're starting on this wall. And they just went to lunch. They're gonna come back and take care of the rest of this. I have to go. I have some family in town, so I'm gonna leave them to it. I left Alex the key. And tonight he's gonna come in with a crew and drywall the inside of the office. So I can't leave the camera here to see that happen. So uh, next time I turn this thing on in here, hopefully uh, I'm showing you guys their beautiful drywall work. The drywall crew was here all weekend getting some things finalized. They're not quite done yet, but they're really close. What a drastic change. But I'll show you more of that later. Right now, uh, we did OSB on the outside of the office. So I have some leftover primer from some house projects. So I'm just gonna throw some primer on the walls and uh, see how it looks. See how much of this texture the primer can fill in on the OSB. So here we go. Okay, so I am going to bring you guys up to speed on where we're at. And while I'm going over what we did, hopefully we can drop in some B-roll of, of the stuff actually happening. So this last few weeks has been kind of a sprint to the finish. 
and I haven't always been able to do these talking to the camera segments, explaining what's going on. I've usually only had enough time just to flip the camera onto time-lapse mode and start capturing some stuff, hoping that I get a chance to explain what's going on later. So um, we'll just go from left to right and show you guys. So we got an exit sign put in uh, and another one out here. Those are just necessary for building code. Uh, the drywall is up and it is painted a color called powder blue. Uh, this gray blue is kind of one of my favorite colors. It puts you in a good mood. I got four lights hung from the ceiling. I bought these from uh, my favorite architectural salvage place, Black Dog Salvage. Uh, I got three more, four more, but there's three more gonna go right here because there'll be a conference table here, hopefully. <clears throat> um, the water is now on. So um, we opened the valve, the plumber came to install the rest of the fixtures and now I have running water in the bathroom. That's exciting. Let me show you guys that. So this is the Lift Dark Studios bathroom. Got a sink rigidly mounted to the wall. Got a toilet, got all the grab bars, got a vent fan, got a vanity light, all the switches and outlets. And my shower is just waiting on a uh, concrete skim coat treatment instead of tile, something cool that I'm gonna try out here. Uh, but it is waterproof. It's got a waterproof membrane over it, so I could use it right now if I had to. Um, and then baseboard and doors is really the only thing I need to do in this office. Oh, and the AC is now on, and it feels amazing. It's obviously leaking out of these giant holes in the wall, but it is on, and uh, it's cooling. It's 83 in here right now, but just feeling that cold air makes it feel a lot less humid like it normally does. Um, my buddy Jake did do a good job with the spiral ducting. I'm a big fan. Looks cool and modern. And uh, yeah, so doors, that's where we're at, doors. Um, these guys are the doors going in the bathroom. These two came from a school. They were salvaged and I just sanded them down, sanded through layers of the paint to expose this cool look. I was gonna paint them, but as I exposed more and more of this finish, I was like, I'm just gonna put them in and clear coat them because they look awesome. So I got two of these for the bathroom and then dad, my dad, Mike, owner of Black Dog, surprised me with this gift. Um, this door is a metal clad fire door from Youngstown, a school in Youngstown, Ohio that we salvaged. Um, and he, we built these, all these jams that the doors are in, we built from scratch out of this pine board. And um, it's just perfect. They're, they're old and industrial, just like this building. They don't look out of place. So this one is going here from the shop into the, into the office. And those two are going over here in the bathroom. So I'm gonna start finagling those, seeing if they work, figuring out if I want them to go left, right, all that, thinking about the flow through the space, and get them mocked up. So enough yapping, I'm gonna figure this out. What's going on everybody? How you doing? Welcome back to Lift Arc Studios on the Machine Shop YouTube channel. Uh, what's that? You want to know how to put a baseboard in an office from five and a half inch pre-painted one-by material that you can buy at Lowe's and you don't 
care to see it done in a fancy way? You want to see just how fast you can put up baseboard and door trim? Well, perfect. I'm here to show you exactly that. That is one of the last steps in, left on the office. I got to put up baseboard, got to trim doors. Um, we have two doors temporarily mounted, almost actually not temporarily, but fully screwed in. Here's one. So there'll be another door here. I got to cover this area with trim and um, the baseboard with trim. I'm going to do it all out of the same material. Uh, this door here goes out into the fab shop. It is different. Dad surprised me with this. This is a really cool fire door. This is galvanized metal wrapped um, and it closes real nice. Me and Steve fine tuned the hinges and the jams yesterday. So they're all screwed in. And so now we just got to cover up all this with trim. So five and a half inch stuff for the big doors. I got a few sticks of three inch. I might do this door with all three inch because you can't exactly fit five and a half inch board here. And then five and a half inch baseboards. So a buddy of mine brought a miter saw by. Uh, it's an old one, but I think she'll do the job. This is the material in question. I got some 12 foot pieces, five and a half inch by three quarter, five and a half inch, three quarter by eight foot. And then this is, uh, I believe three and a half by three quarter by eight foot. And it's all pre-painted. Um, it's not the cleanest material in the world. I'll just go by and either clean it with a magic eraser or just give it a final coat of paint once it's all installed. So. I'm going to be nailing it to the wall. Got a stud finder. So I'll lay it up, scan this guy along the wall. Boom. Shoot some nails in there. Shoot some nails right there. So on and so forth. Um, here we go. So uh, I got to cut around the hinges. These doors have really cool uh, ball hinges on them, which means they stick up and out quite a bit more than normal hinges. So I've marked, I put a mark at the upper and lower extent of each hinge where it hits the trim board. And I just got to notch out a little 45 in each spot so it'll fit around the hinges. This is the last day I really want to be working on these doors, so I got a lot planned for today. So I'm going to put automatic closers on all three doors. I need to put some uh, hardware on the doors, just some simple uh, lever latches, I believe, for ADA. This um, bathroom is 
ADA, which is like handicap accessible. Uh, the door latches have to be the lever type. Um, and then I'm just gonna pop them off the hinges once all the hardware is cut and mounted. Uh, I'll take everything back off, lay them on uh, saw horses, finish sand them, uh, clear coat them, because I think I'm just gonna clear and keep, keep this look. And then um, rehang them and we'll be done. And that is pretty much the last thing I need to do before the final building inspection, other than mounting the last three light fixtures up there. And then my AC guy needs to come back and put one more vent right there. So that stuff I'm trying to get done today and tomorrow. Uh, it's Wednesday. I'd like to get the final building inspection done by Friday. So here we go. I gotta say, that was very easy. That jig worked very well. Other than the hole saws getting clogged with the material that they cut out of the door, which obviously I know happens, I gotta work those out. I, I thought the installation was super easy. This door is solid poplar, which makes it really easy. Poplar cuts really nice. It's rather soft, so working with it's pretty easy. But now, I can make a mark where my latch needs to go. Um, yeah, locks on the inside. Obviously, you don't want to get locked in the bathroom. Everything is super easy. So I'm going to do the same to the next, the other two doors and then mount my latches and uh, I'll be done with that. It's a lot faster than I thought. Yay, progress. Okay, it's the next day, and uh, this is the last day I'm working on the office, hopefully before I can apply for the final building inspection, which I will order today to happen tomorrow, regardless. Ice cream guys here. Um, so here's where we left off. All the trim is done. Um, the hole, the nail holes are not yet filled with spackle. Damn it, I just realized that I forgot the spackle at the house. It's okay, I don't think that's gonna make me fail my inspection. Uh, Doorknobs mounted, closer. Hey, Stella, Stella, there's AC in here. Stay in here. This one has a closer, knob, and latch. So that door is complete. This one has knob and latch, no closer. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Because I mounted one here hooked it to the door, it worked great, I was excited. And then I went to open this door, as you can see this way, and it hit the arm of the closer. And I tried for about 45 minutes to flip it upside down, try different positions, and I just couldn't find a position. So I'm hoping I don't have to have a closer on this door. Always be closing, always be closing. Just because I think we all, I think we all know how to close a door without a closer. It kind of has that on the plans, but hopefully it's not a deal breaker. And then this door, I have my closer mounted and it works. I had to tune it up a little bit so it didn't slam the door. It was slamming the door every time. But I honestly don't want to put a doorknob on it. I screwed this handle to it that I got at Black Dog. And it'd be nice, because I imagine this door, you're gonna go in and out of a lot, going in between the office and the shop. And it'd be nice just to kind of walk through 
and push to get into the space. And then when you're coming back to the office, just grab this, run in, and you're back in the office. And the door closes behind you. Literally the only thing left is these three lights. So I got three of these lights, just like those that are going here. Um, but I had to order new wire because I wanted to make them lower. The ceiling's super tall. I like the height of those, but right here, there's gonna be a table. And uh, I'd like the lights to come down a little bit more so that you have good light over the table. Um, you know, typically if you look at dining room chandeliers, they're, they're pretty low as far as the height is like off the ground is concerned. Um, that being said, I don't want it so short that if I move the table for whatever reason, that I don't walk under them and hit my head on them. So that's the minimum or maximum that they'll be lowered, which is basically, I don't know, maybe you guys can see, two feet maybe lower than the, these are here. So anyway, I'm gonna spend some time rewiring these. I got new sockets screw with screw terminals and uh, a roll of, I think it's 100 feet, hopefully, oh, it's 50 feet. Well, anyway, divide that by three, that should give me plenty of wire. And uh, yeah, I won't make you guys sit through that. I'll, uh, long form, we'll just time lapse it. So here we go. What's going on everybody? Tay here back down at Lift Dark Studios, the machine shop, and uh, a lot has changed since I last checked in with you guys. Uh, you've probably already seen a bunch of it behind me. We got big metal racks over here, wood rack over here. The fab shop is starting to come together back there. But today, Steve and I are building a compressor house for this compressor. This is a, I think it's an 80 gallon Ingersoll Rand compressor that I got from my house, uh, being that I used to have a little fab shop set up at home, but this is now my new shop. So everything that was there can be moved here. And it sit out in the weather for a few years. I've been meaning to build an awning over it and never got to it, but that's okay because now it's here and inside. Let's see what Steve's drawn. Oh yeah, it's gonna be a nice one. So the front door will be hinged so we can get to it. And then this extra space oh right and then the next to it is going to be plywood storage so all this stuff you saw me bring in from that uh dude's shop that i cleaned out there will be a four foot by four foot 
like closet there basically and then to the right of it will be a section that we can store plywood so i'm not going to talk anymore it's time for a montage <laughs> Bridgeport, which should be some indication of where we are as far as the shop is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, by now you've seen the entire process. You've seen digging through the dirt. You've seen us rip down a mezzanine and move machines and shovel and clean and degrease and hurt ourselves. Well, actually, we're pretty good, actually. Yeah. There's some stuff mm -hmm. on our lungs probably still <laughs> from the early part, but we're good. And then new slab, new office, bringing everything back in, uh, wiring, plumbing, and all that. You've seen the office. Why don't I go show you the shop? <laughs> <laughs> so, blah, 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 lights and paint. Great. Actually, uh, Walker's desk will be featured in an upcoming build video. I taught Walker how to weld, and he's actually really good at it. Uh, brought the editing rig in, so he's editing actually editing this episode right now. Putting a Glenn Gary, Glenn <laughs> Ross uh, movie reference in. Perfect. Let's go through here. And here's Wilson. Wilson! Our uh, 2001 Chevy 2500 work truck. Painted um, well. Uh, <laughs> wood rack, metal rack. Uh, the lights, they're all on. How about that? Somebody was asking for a, a reveal video. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, all the miscellaneous hardware from the original machine shop is up here in these totes and on the racks and out of the way. Uh, some blades that I need to work on. And then uh, all of this is becoming highly functional. So we'll start over here. We have a Powermatic 66 table saw. Works. With this giant sled. Big Bessemeyer fence and an outfeed table. Super nice. Um, clamp rack. Drill press. Back here, we have an 80 gallon compressor that's been cleaned up. This came from my house. I actually bought this from Wyatt. And uh, I've plumbed it into the ceiling. Wired it up kind of temporarily for now. Um, here's all that plywood storage that you saw us build. Uh, we got this chop saw table screwed to the wall. We got a dust collector just, just plumbed up to the table saw for now. Uh, this is why it's chop saw. <laughs> That's been given a hoe. <laughs> Not quite, but it's happier now. It works a little bit better. Um, we got a, this table actually came from the machine shop, but we got a, a collection of uh, chopped band saws that are really handy for cutting stuff. Um, Steve, my buddy, who's also a fabricator that's renting space for me, this is his welding setup, MIG and TIG. Um, and this wooden table has been converted to a metal table. It's a piece of 3 16 steel on top. Not the best, can't dump a lot of heat into it because wood does catch on fire, but it's not the worst. Uh, and then back here, these machines came from the machine shop. They were all underneath the mezzanine. 
Um, I have to get a blade for this, but this is a, a vertical bandsaw. This is a 19, probably 70s Craftsman drill press. It works really well. This is that vertical sander uh, that was built during World War II. Still works great. Old Porter cable. Uh, this toolbox came from my house um, and it was filled with mostly mechanics tools. So I've been retooling and relabeling and reorganizing power tools, drills, impacts. This metal table was in my shop at home and it's been completely rebuilt with four by four inch square legs and I-beams so that it is perfectly flat and perfectly level. Um, toolboxes, organization, pallet racking. You saw us move this over here. That was over in that corner. Uh, I've got an oxyacetylene torch here. A lot of stuff still from the old machine shop that I need to go through. And then a uh, sound system. <laughs> This thing is extremely loud, um, and I have it right next to me, so that'll be fine. Uh, my welder. This is my bread and butter. It's my everyday carry. So it's a 12-year-old Millermatic 212 MIG welder. Got a new torch and handle for it. Made a little holder for that. I weld with 2575 argon and CO2. Got a TIG welder back there. And then, why and I just spent the morning cleaning up this uh, 1969 Bridgeport J-Head mill. Why don't you come in here? Oh. And that's why we look like this. Look like foul. <laughs> but uh, you, you can now see the cut, the paint. It actually all looked like that before. And they still used it. But uh, it's a 223 phase machine. Bridgeport's, it's not technically true, but kind of, they say it's the only machine that can build itself. Uh, which is kind of a really oversimplified way to explain what this does. It can make just about any part, milling, cutting, drilling, shaping, surfacing, with a big collection of mills and parts and things. So someone who really knows how to use this machine is a dangerous person in a good way. Um, but it's clean now, it needs to be lubricated and uh, we need to put more focus into the cutters and the accessories for it, which are all packed away somewhere. But that is kind of where the shop is at the moment. We've got air in the ceiling, two air reels coming out, uh, still a lot of space. And then all this over here, I haven't really done anything with yet. These are, these are the machines that I've kept from the old shop that I believe I'll be able to put back into Those service. Are the machines that I'm excited about. We're gonna look way dirtier than this way getting dirty. through here. But this hydraulic press is definitely gonna be usable. They still make rebuild kits for these, nice. and they're 45 years old. Um, yeah, and then that from here you can see the office and how much space in the building it actually took up. It's about 400 square feet, and then up top is where all the uh, there's the air handler up there and the water heater is up there. Um, and then of course we kept the line shaft system. It still runs, just haven't run power to it yet. Um, a few of these machines still run off the line shaft and I'd like to bring them back to life somehow. But that's pretty much where we're at. So next few things on the channel are gonna be build videos. So yes, there's still work to do on the shop, but I have already started to build things, not only for clients, but just for fun, for friends, things that we need around the shop and in the office, like a desk for Walker. Um, so that's what you'll start to see next, and that'll become pretty regular. I think between all of us, we have some pretty wild ideas that we've always been wanting to build. Been Look at all this floor space. So much do aerobics in here. So many activities. Do step class. It's making my head spin how many activities we can do. And the goal is to do enough paying jobs per month to where we either take a day or a week off from client work and just build something cool. So. Let us know, actually, it's a perfect opportunity, what you wanna see us build in this shop. Gosh, this video is already 25 minutes long. <laughs> uh, drop us a line, let us know what you think. This, my friends, is Lift Arc Studios, now operating in the former Price Filler Machine Shop in downtown Roanoke. So, liftarcstudios.com, Tay at Lift Arc Studios. Shoot me an email, drop us a line, let us know what you think. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and yes, YouTube. And uh, yeah, we want to connect with you just as much as um, you want to connect with us. So thanks for watching. See you next time.